Day two, three, not sure. Um, I've been here since Monday. <laughs> I'm Chanda Z, and I am your programs director, and I want to welcome you all back to the Demonstrating Artist Hall, and I really appreciate everyone being here. I am really grateful, and I'm still living with Rose's words from Wednesday night about the gift that we all have here being together. Um, and I'm really excited to once again introduce two of our demonstrating artists today. Um, we have with us ceramic artist Beth Lowe, who makes word about family, culture, and language. Her good children, vessels, and sculptures garnered her fellowships from United States Artists and the National Endowment for the Arts. She taught ceramics at the University of Montana from 1985 to 2016, and is also a children's book illustrator and professional bass player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and with Beth today, we have Natasha Smoke Santiago. Um, Natasha is a Turtle Clan woman of the Haudenosaunee, or people of the Longhouse, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, Natasha resides within the territory of the Aquasusne, and she works in many mediums, including acrylics, paint, clay, and more. Heavily influenced by her heritage, Santiago's focal point in the arts has mainly been works with clay, creating traditional Mohawk pottery, pipe making, and sculpture. So before you give them a warm welcome, I also want to ask all of you, if you have a question for Beth or Natasha, could you please step to one of these microphones that are in the aisles? Um, we are recording this because these, these are our people, right? These are our featured folks that are sharing their techniques and we're recording this. So if you don't step to the microphone, all we're gonna have is the answer. We're not gonna have the questions you ask. Um, so please join me now in giving a warm welcome to Natasha and Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Natasha and I had a really good time meeting each other yesterday and working together. So um, I just thought we'd both give a little short intro as what we're going to be working on. And, uh, and then we'll get started. But I want to thank uh, Chandra. She was amazing. And I'd like to thank uh, Nsika in general, plus uh, Melissa Zachary, who is kind of amazing. She's our She's the person that did all the email liaison and made sure that we had all the equipment that we needed. And just, she's like, you ask a question and she responds so quickly. And I want to thank all the volunteers and my assistant, Lee Sturmans, who's helping out. He's from Missoula. And he, we didn't bring his cup up to show, but I'll, I'll bring a piece of his out so you can see what kind of work he does. Um, Today, what I'm planning to do is kind of finish up what I started yesterday, which is I started a vase using a technique, using a template, a cardboard template, which is how I make some of my coil pots. I'll try to get it to the point where I, have a, I can make a lid for it. And then what I had planned to do for most of today is paint. Um, so I will I'll, we'll dry this out to a point where I can paint on it and then I'll paint on some of the pieces that I made yesterday and if it gets too boring to watch me to just sit and work like this then I can repeat some of these demos. Um, would love questions. It's early for me. I'm not a morning person so if you think about me coming from Montana that's two hours earlier plus the time change happened just this week. So 9 o'clock feels like 6 a.m. to start. <laughs> anyway, so uh, just forgive me if my brain is not 100%. Um, Dasha, you want to describe what you've got going? Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I have some pots here already started from yesterday. This one I finished right at the end of the demonstration yesterday. And you, you can look, I have a shell design here. This is the mountain design. It not only represents the mountains, but the 
growing mounds and the rows in our garden. The circles represent the seeds, three sisters, corn bean and squash. Uh, I had also used some of our, our traditional tools, uh, the deer antler to make these little markings. I had a fish bone for here and then corn. So I'll be demonstrating using some of my tools later on. So this one was just a simple pinch pot. And then, so what I'm doing is I'm going through my timeline of how I learned the sizes, kind of working my way up in size and technique to show you how I, how I work. So this one was a bowl method with a pinch pot. And then I added a coil. Uh, I do a slab work. If some of you weren't here yesterday you, to see, this was a hand slab that I attached here. This is the bottom of a bowl. No, no coiling yet, no slab. And then this one is the same with, with the slab. So just kind of a little bit variation in size, a little different in the shape. And so I think I'm gonna get started. Um, I don't know if everybody was here yesterday, but I'm visiting from the Akwizasne Mohawk Nation, which is in upstate New York. We have Ontario and Quebec also. So I like to think of us as like the hat of New York State. Um, really honored to be here, and I hope that you find my work interesting, and I hope that you learn something today. I'll just say I'm doing this uh, pot. Um, most of my work comes from my Asian American background. Um, when I started making pots, I was pretty much just making reduction pottery and pretty much the typical thing. I fell in love with the wheel. I just thought, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing that I could be doing with my body and my mind. Uh, and then little by little, I started thinking about what kinds of things I had to say. Um, and after I gave birth to my son, which is 1987, uh, I started realizing that I, I needed to work more directly with my feelings, and that changed my content towards working with things, uh, issues about how to raise a child. I started this whole series called the Good Children Series. I started thinking about my parents. It started to be, occur to me that I was passing on something. I became much more interested in parenting in general and uh, respecting what my parents had gone through to get to the United States. Um, when I was little, I used to sort of deny my heritage. And as I got older, I became more willing to accept it and find interest in it and find resource and find my tribe throughout through my uh, Asian American background. So all that said, what I'm trying to get to about this pot is that as I became more and more interested in Asian issues and Asian American issues, I started thinking a lot about the, the balances between Eastern and Western cultures and about how my particular specific individual thing that I had to say had to do with not belonging to any one side. I was not, definitely didn't fit in with the, age, the, the people, friends of my parents who were directly immigrated from China and I didn't really fit in with the cheerleaders in the high school. <laughs> you know, the, the two dichotomies. So, um, uh, where I fit in, there was this wonderful place called Chinese Family Camp, which was where a lot of our parents took us kids, assuming that we would marry, find somebody to marry. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the people that got it, the people that I felt like were just like me, were the Asian Americans. So I started realizing that there's a space of belonging and not belonging or belonging to two worlds are being split. So a lot of my work is about the two divisions of culture, the Western culture and the, and the traditional culture that I inherited, both of which have a lot to offer. So that's bringing me down to this specific jar, and I'll try and talk specifically about the things I paint um, in terms of those dichotomies. But this, this jar, 
I, I, I make a lot of vases, vases as this whole conference is about, about I contain multitudes. Vessels can be so evocative and have so many different meanings and so many different references. And so when I started making vases, I thought not only about the fact that they could be functional, but also that they could be metaphorical and that I liked. I was interested in the, the classical shapes from China but some of the shapes of China, they're very severe. I don't know if you've seen some of them. They're just so exaggerated. Ch there's an aspect of Chinese art that's very formal. Um, but one of the types of jars that I like is the ginger jar. And the ginger jar is uh, from earliest ginger jars, I think, are like 200 BC in the Qing Dynasty. And it was for storing ginger. And it's this classic shape. Um, pretty full-bellied around with a lid. And as there became more contact with the West, there was exchange and sales, and the ginger was for sale in Western countries. And it usually had double happiness written in kind of blocky, almost like advertising font. So I'm going to use the ginger jar shape and work with it in terms of identity and and sort of a popular culture take on it. So that's, that's what I hope to work on for this particular piece. Okay. Hi, Beth. Um, uh, can be I ask quiet. a question really quick? <laughs> oh, hi. Hi, sorry. Um, you were talking about being split culture as like an Asian American. Yes. And I guess my question for you is whether or not you feel, I mean, for both of you really, is whether or not you feel like you can lose one's culture. Um, I'm adopted, so mm -hmm. I, you know, I never knew my birth parents. My parents were actually white and Jewish. So I never, you know, I, I was raised Jewish and I felt very connected to that culture until I became race conscious in about like elementary school because people would make fun of me for not being white. Um, but I don't have any way to have a direct link to like the culture of my origin. I really mm -hmm. like a lot of the Chinese traditional pottery, severe as it is sometimes, yeah. right? Um, and in a weird way, I sometimes feel like I'm appropriating Chinese culture when I do it, even though I'm Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it. And that, that whole thing about what's fair to use. And um, well, first to get back to your point about, about whether you can lose your culture. I think you can deny it, you can lose it, you can ignore it. There's all kinds of ways to, to do that. And, I think if you want to embrace it, sometimes you have to work at it a little bit. Um, and, and sometimes it's forced. I think sometimes it's a little forced. And one of my first, um, let me get that coil. One of the first uh, difficult conversations I had with the gallery was when I showed some of my work. And she said, uh, this was Dorothy Weiss Gallery. I don't know if any of you remember that, but Dorothy Weiss, looked at my work and said, this is too easy. It's too easy for you to just appropriate Chinese culture and use it. You know, it's too obvious. And so I thought about that and I decided I didn't agree with it, but that I also agreed with it to the sense that I could go deeper. Um, so I think there's, when you work, there's intuitive and there's analytical. And maybe the analytical side tells you to just investigate it, and or maybe it's the intuitive side, either. Um, I think you can work at it. A um, couple other things is uh, how we look is kind of important. And um, even when, uh, I've heard that when some adoptive agencies, even when there's white parents that are adopting, they try to match the face because you want to see something that you're comfortable with. And so, little fat face or skinny face or whatever, even with non-Asian faces. They try to do something to make people feel comfortable. And I also, I know when I go to places and I see Asian faces, I just am attracted to them. Or on TV, I see an Asian athlete and I go, oh, I like that one. <laughs> Um, then the last thing I'm going to say, and I promised that I wouldn't talk so much today, um, but uh, 
the last thing is that there's this Chinese family camp that I talked about, which is where I found my Chinese American friends, and I found that this is where I was comfortable. It has morphed over the years. It is still going. It started when I was like three or four. It happens in, the, in Indiana or sometimes Ohio, and there are tons of adoptive families that go there now. So that could be another little mini tribe. <laughs> um, and there's, the, there's, there's all these kids. It's an incredibly welcoming, open, happy, family-oriented camp. And my cousin runs it, Alan Young from uh, Chicago. So I can put you in touch with him. I'm from Chicago, so that would be... <laughs> What's that? I, I'm from Chicago, actually. So, oh, my gosh. Um, I, yeah. I will say before I step down that, you know, I've been accused of being like not authentically Chinese by mm -hmm. some international students before. Like, you're not a real Chinese person. You're not authentic. Um, and I'm trying to find my authenticity recently in the fact that like it is authentic to be the byproduct of the one child law. I'm not alone. Yeah. There are so many. And it was a cultural fact that the government limited people to one child and put all those restrictive forces on them and the fact that you know I very well could have come from a family who wanted me yeah uh, and I think that is authentic um, and absolutely pursue that a little bit yeah and I mean for me I always I tend to draw from my uh, personal experience um, and it's worked out for me well. It makes it's comfortable. It's a comfortable place because I know it so well. So maybe that will work for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have a question for Natasha. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm fascinated by the work that you're doing right now. And if you could talk a little bit about the meaning of the type of des um, decoration you're doing, I'd be really interested to hear. Thank you. Um, so right now, I'm putting on the points, which are referred to as castellations. If, you, if you're an archaeologist, you'll, you will call them castellations. And I'm also going to be putting on what they call reed and ladder. That's what I'm working on right now. It's not a ladder. That, and the reason they called the, it that was that we used reeds to make the markings, and they thought that it looked like a ladder, but it's our corn. So I'm going to be making a corn pot right now. I'm going to put the corn on. So you see, I made, I made my cuts, and I'm going to recycle the pieces here. I've scored them on the back, and I've lined them up. And I'm just going to put some water in there. A lot of Haudenosaunee pottery has to do with our gardens and nature, our food sustenance. When I was talking about our designs yesterday with, um, with the way that I, I see it, um, we don't know all of the meanings of the design. Like I know a lot by word of mouth, like you know, the mountain designs and uh, the rose in the garden. But I've really had to like look at it on my own and figure out some of the archeology, span the older pieces. Um, and I see, in the designs I see rapids, uh, even though everything's very geometric, rapids, I see arrowheads flying sideways, that's hunting. So being that we're hunter-gatherers, and that we would grow the three sisters, the corn, bean, and squash, you definitely see a lot of that right on in the design. You should all go to the um, Weston, I think, and I forget what the center is called, but the, the Ensika National and see uh, Natasha's work in person because, first of all, the scale of the pieces there is really impressive. 
And it's just amazing to see the fired product and the surfaces that are created from the smoke and um, to see the, the markings are so careful and so precise. They really hold a lot of integrity and beauty. So we were lucky. We just ran into each other yesterday at the gallery. <laughs> we didn't know each other were going to be there. And I started saying, look, there's some Natasha's pots. And she's like right there. <laughs> she was talking and I said, I hear you talking about me. <laughs> I came over and we... Yeah. It was nice. It was really nice. Yes. Well, you should also see her work. It's beautiful. It's there, it's too. It's a really nice setup, if you could make it over. It's the Weston Art Gallery at the Arnoff? Is it Arnoff? Is it Arnoff? Yeah, I just yeah. Can't, I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And there's a reception this evening. I believe mm -hmm. it starts at 6. Yeah, and not a lot of the artists will be there, of course. So, so if you can Check make it, it, definitely stop by and... Come say hello, check out all of the work, all the beautiful work. Maybe some of you guys weren't here um, yesterday, but when you were talking about your gardens, um, you should talk about the seed project. Okay, or so. Or at least partly. Just a little background information. Um, Haudenosaunee pottery hasn't been kind of uh, used and since the late 1600s, early 1700s, when my ancestors encountered the Dutch and the French during the fur trade. Um, we started, um, being that we're utilitarian people, we started using the brass kettle. And it was documented that we would trade four beaver pelts per one brass kettle. Mm. And so if you think about it, it must have been this magic pot that didn't break. You know, so lightweight, convenient, you just pack it and go. And you know, like even for if you were a hunter, imagine carrying around a small pot or like, you know, the men used to go out on hunting parties at times. And so the convenience of not having to carry something that's breakable. Um, so yeah, that's when my ancestors had quit using the pottery. It wasn't something that was lost per se. It was just, we kind of left it, we retired it. And so right now across all Haudenosaunee territory, I believe there's less than 10 traditional potters and only two of us are women. And I'm proud to say that I helped teach the other woman. And uh, I'm always looking to learn as much as possible, whether it be from studying the archives and archaeology, speaking with elders, I've picked up a lot of information, you know, because a lot of our, my culture is uh, oral tradition. Everything's by word of mouth, a lot of storytelling. And so um, I've gotten bits and pieces all over the place. And when I'm traveling, going to different indigenous food summits, um, and so I like to think of what I do as like, I'm, I have these bits and pieces of the pottery and I'm gathering it to make the, whole, the pot whole again. And so with that, I've grown over time and it, it seems like more doors keep opening and I get more and more into it to where we started cooking in the pots and now I have this big dream to to start storing our food because I'm a seed keeper of our heirloom seeds. Um, and I wanna kind of try out some of the old ways that I've heard about, which is burying the pots beneath the frost line. Cause you know, I'm from a really cold place and our people used to have food cash banks, like hidden food. We, we would hide the food, but, but also, you know, keeping it under the ground it keeps it at the right temperature. And also, at times, uh, well, the longhouses had a, a root cellar that in the winter time where they could just go in, it was buried into the ground. So, um, my point is that we're, I, we're going to be having a garden this summer. We're gonna grow our seeds, we're going to harvest them, dry them, and then we're gonna implement them into the pottery, store them in the pottery, and try out the old ways. 
And it's the first time that anyone has done it since way back when. So I'm very proud, I'm very excited. And that, that is someone, something that I've uh, been planning with uh, the Everson. I, they're my partner, the Everson Museum of Art and Design in Syracuse. I'm a recipient of a, a, a grant called Creative Rebuilds New York. They had a call out to um, all artists across New York State, and the only 300 uh, projects were awarded. So I'm really proud to say that uh, we were the recipient of one of those awards. So I'll be working with the Everson for two years. Uh, I have about a year and a half left. I'm very excited. Uh, and so that's one of the projects that we'll be working on this summer. Um, did somebody, did you have a question? Hey, um, good morning. Thank you for being here. Congratulations. This is amazing. And um, I feel that your passion um, for your art is certainly contagious. Um, I was going to ask if you had a guild or how you were learning so much about your history and your art. But I also wanted to ask, when you made the score and slip earlier, you did it with such purpose. Was there um, a point? Was that a plant or a seed when you were scoring the sides before you put the points back on, before, the, you, before you put the cuts back on? You scored it so nicely and precisely. Was there? Um, oh, I just like to make it line up. OK. <laughs> I, I obsess <laughs> over it. Too much. You'll notice like I, I try to have like exact lines. Um, I think I have OCD. <laughs> I'm very particular about all of my line work. Um, did you ask about a kiln? I, I a didn't... guild, like you, you, you answered the question um, part way. I asked, I wanted to know, like, how did you find out so much about your heritage and the art from your, from your, your heritage oh. or from your, your well, family, and your past? I um, grew up. I was fortunate to grow up in a family that has our culture and language intact. Um, so I grew up with it. It wasn't something that was gone. I, I, I was immersed in our, our ceremonies, our songs, our dances. I heard the language, but unfortunately, I wasn't taught fluently. And uh, that has, is a result of you know, residential schools. My great-grandmother, my, my grandmother's mother was in the mush hole in Six Nations. She's from Brantford, Ontario. Mohawk Turtle Clan, and so her language was taken from her. Um, and then also my grandfather w was in a day school. Mohawk language was his first language, and um, by the time he finished there, he didn't want to teach his children. It was a bad thing to teach the language. So although we heard it a lot at home, you know, common phrases at home, um, not fluent, and I know a lot. But my family, I would say, became advocates of our, our culture. My grandmother uh, developed a program called the Native American Resource Center in Rochester, New York. She developed the curriculum with a, a small group of Native women. They had an after-school program for, for children, Native children, who lived in the cities so that they could know who they are and where they come from and not to lose touch with their, you know, their culture. So I got to see all of that. I was always in the background. There's some photos. There's my grandma up there. Oh, it, it switched, but um, <laughs> she's a moccasin maker. And my grandfather is a gustoa maker, which is the men's headdress. And so I, I kind of grew up in a little bit of the art scene, you know, doing art shows and powwows, craft shows. Grandma was always selling her moccasins and her, her goods. And my mother did beadwork. My mom was the navigator before Google Maps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was my grandma's sidekick, and I was their sidekick. So that's how I, I became into the art, art world. And I started off with painting. My mom said I started painting when I was three years old. And then I just kept up with it. And then pretty soon I started selling little pieces of artwork on their table. 
Then it evolved into business cards, paintings. And then by the time I was 18, I realized at one of our art shows that I had taken over half my mom's table. <laughs> and I kept saying, do you have a pen? Do you have this? Do you have that? I was borrowing things. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I better... I realized that I was going to continue being an artist for the rest of my life. So I started investing in my own tables, my own Easy Up, and started doing shows on my own. Um, with the pottery, I learned the pottery when I was 17 years old. There was a local artist potter who had put on the, the, the pottery workshop. He had uh, basically gone out to Santa Fe and studied with the Pueblos and learned their traditional ways. He brought it home to Aquizasne and applied it to our clay and our designs. And then he had this class. And one of the things that kind of stuck with me was that um, he told the group that he didn't want to be the only Mohawk potter <laughs> and that it was our responsibility. He hopes that one of us or some of us carry on the tradition. Now, I didn't do anything with the pottery right away for about three years. And then I feel like I kind of got pulled into it, and, um, which was someone saw my art portfolio and they saw the pottery in there and they happened to run the oh, jeweler site in St. Anisset, Quebec, which is a close. Mohawk yeah. uh, archeology span site where they have found old longhouse posts and the pottery shards. So they rebuilt the longhouses and they have a museum there. They wanted me to instruct a pottery workshop. I was about maybe 19 or 20. And I was really afraid, but I, I agreed. And it was just me and a bag of clay and some skewers. <laughs> there was also a, a gentleman who was the translator because they speak mostly French there. He was wonderful, big help. And so I learned I started studying the archives, and then I started studying in museums, and I couldn't get enough. I just loved it. I, get, I love the little pottery shards and little pieces. It's just a little glimpse. You don't see the whole pot. Mm. And that's what my teacher said, Sosagete. He said that he, he saw a pot in the New York State Museum when he was a child on a field trip, and he said that he had this deep yearning to hold the pot, and it wasn't fair that it was behind glass, it belonged to his people, and he couldn't hold it, he couldn't mm -hmm. touch it. And that's where his passion came to, you know, bringing him out west, and then, you know, bringing it home, and then revitalizing it. And there are other Haudenosaunee potters, but um, in terms of, like, the traditional methods, like what, what I learned from, from Sosegete, uh, there's, there's really not, that wasn't there. So I, I do feel this sense of, uh, large sense of responsibility, and it's an honor to, to know what I've picked up here and there, and what I like to share. You know, I like to share wherever I go. I love to travel, meet new folks, and learn about their cultures and their traditions, and kind of see similarities, too. I have a question, Tasha. You, in your statement, you talked about your um, your tribe as matrilineal or matri. Yes, matrilineal. <laughs> so I'm wondering what that what that meant and what the different roles are for men and women. And also, you said that um, there are some men, male potters, and only one other female potters. And I know some cultures certain parts of pottery are in, you know, s separated off into male and female roles. I was wondering what the situation was with your culture. M matrilineal means that, um, for, for my culture, means that you get your clan, your, your clan from your mother. There's nine different animal clans in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Uh, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy is the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and the Tuscaroras. And uh, we're known as the Iroquois, but we don't call ourselves that. 
Um, and th so the, there's nine clans. I'm Turtle Clan, and you get your clan from your mother. Uh -huh. And so that's your family, that's your, your bloodline. But also, so you don't ever marry the same clan. You don't? No. Um, <laughs> no way. That's huh? your family across the, <laughs> uh, across yeah. the board. So um, that's a no-no. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, my grandmother's turtle clan, her, grandma, her mother was turtle clan and so on. And my grandfather was bear clan. So that would we were all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, in terms of the, the pottery, um, I've been told that only the women made the pots, mm -hmm. but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. Hmm. They have, um, they find little, uh, they found like a pipe with no hole that like a little, a child had made. It had little tiny fingerprints. Wow. So I don't think a mom would stop anyone, any of their children yeah. from learning. And then also, you know, if you were a hunter that was male and you needed something like a pot, I'm sure you could make it up really mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah. You know, it's, it was a, a way of life and it mm -hmm. was, the pots were so important, not only to cook the food, gather your water, but the food storage. And they were used as storage vessels. They would hang them on the longhouse rafters. We didn't have lids. So I, I like to think that we used leather and then we would tie the, the, the uh, leather or bark twine around the outside to hang it. They were buried. So there was a lot of different uses for the pots. I don't know if I answered yeah, all the questions. Yeah, you did. Thanks. Yeah. I was thinking about the marriage thing. Because um, in, in my parents' generation, there were still arranged marriages in, in China. And my, my parents, they didn't have that. My parents were lucky enough to have chosen each other. Um, but their best friends, Uncle and Auntie Shu, <laughs> they, um, their marriage was arranged and they, Auntie Shu hated Uncle Shu when she first met him. <laughs> and I, I, it's a really tough thing. So, but it's, I think I'm good. But it's still, it's, it's interesting to think about how, how those kinds of things uh, evolve and, and what it means for their culture. Um, I guess I didn't have a real segue for that, except for that. Uh, I wanted to share something that kind of sparked in my mind mm -hmm. when you were asking about some of the, the roles. Um, in our culture, the, the women were, you know, everyone was equal mm. and everyone had a role you know, being that we, we lived in a, as a, a community and we helped one another. Um, something interesting that I could share is that, you know, may, some of you may already know this, but the, the government, the United States, based their democracy off of the Haudenosaunee way of life. Huh. And um, we taught the military how to march and also the eagle became very important symbol in America because it was important to us. The, the eagle is the one that watches out and protects us and they warn us if there's danger coming. So just some of the things that are in, in, in your own history of America that you don't, maybe don't hear about all the time. You know, even the arrows, the arrows that are in the eagle's talons on the dollar bill, that's symbolic. You know, if you break one arrow, it's weak. If you have several arrows, that's us together. You know, the Haudenosaunee, we, we're strong together. We're weak when we're, if we're fighting and we're not united. Unity, one mind. A lot of our, our ways are about giving thanks and being grateful and sharing that unity. One dish, one spoon. You might hear that sometimes too. But we're all, all, all about the better of the people as a whole. So this technique that I'm 
using was um, taught to me by my friend Jeannie Quinn, who teaches at University of Colorado Boulder. And she taught this to me probably 20 years ago, and I didn't really start using it until I started making this vase series again and started thinking about, um, about work in the form. But uh, I will have to say, um, I'm just learning a little bit more about getting it right. And um, I, will, I will sure form this down some more because I'm gonna, I do wanna draw on it. So we'll just let that set up a little bit more. Um, it's sort of, it's sort of hard to think about talking and not repeating what you said yesterday or saying it in a different way. Yes, um, <laughs> I agree. I think we should only, it should only be one day. <laughs> and, then, and then you'll remember something yeah. right after you were talking about it. Like, I should have said this I as well. Said, uh, yeah. Oh, well, so maybe. Like, Go ahead. Is there a question? No. That also the, the women's rights suffrage movement, mm -hmm. those women were inspired by the Seneca women. They saw that we had, they saw it as power. But it was equality, and that we had a balance, and we shared, and we respected each other, and no one was elevated above anyone. So that's where that came from. They they were inspired by the Seneca Nation, the women, the Haudenosaunee women, and they were quite involved in that as well. I have a question for Natasha. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the smoke firing uh, process and technique as compared to pit firing, um, like specifically with your smoke firings, do you cover it at all or is it just surrounded and, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? Thanks. Yes. Um, so, although I do know how to pit fire, it's not my favorite. I, f I find there tends to be a lot of loss in the pit firing or uneven, you know, it might be fired on one side of the pot more than the other. So I prefer to have my, my pieces bisque fired first. That way it's a good, strong, even firing. And then I do outdoor smoking, which consists of, uh, I, I like to use cedar the very most, like the greens, some white pine once in a while, although I prefer the cedar because it has more of a variation of marbling and color whereas the pine tends to be really white or really black. And, I, and it, um, it's beautiful, but I find the markings of the cedar more interesting. And um, so I, use, I do use those materials the very most. I, I like to use pet bedding, pine. So I, could, I make a bed of the, the pine shavings, then I wrap my greens and then I, I put the, the uh, shavings on top. And I usually try to light it in a manner, it's all open. I try to light it at the top and central or equally around the sides and then it, it goes up. And then I watch it and I have gloves that I'll pull my stuff out when I, either when it's done or if it's getting too hot, then you know, I, I might yank it out. I don't want any hairlines in my work. That's always the scariest when you hear that ting, <laughs> especially with the larger pots, that's the worst. But um, I try to avoid that. And with my most largest vessel so far, it's 17 inches high. It's, it's at the Westin, if you wanna take a look at it. But that one, I really babied that in the firing when I did fire it. I was able to um, use kiln furniture and bricks, and I built I think just, a box, just heat that a, a very tight box around the large vessel, but I couldn't go, I didn't have pieces high enough, so then I stacked them this way, and then I went up over. I filled it with uh, the pine and all the cedar and then I laid the kiln furniture on top. So I tried to cut off as much oxygen as possible and I had it going very slowly. 
and it took me all day. It took me all afternoon. So, so you can have really fast smoking and be done in an hour, hour and a half. Or if it's the larger vessels, you, you know, should definitely try to take your time, especially if you don't want those hairlines. So I'm still learning. I'm learning. I'm trying to grow larger vessels. I, I really struggle to do the, the larger sizes with, I get so long with the, the coil or the slab that I've had to like throw them over my shoulder, have it on my arm, and then I have another piece over here. So I'm like trying to, you know, flop it up and get it going without kinking it, or especially if it's a slab. So it's been quite a challenge. It's been frustrating, but it's worth all of the, the struggles, you know, to learn and really understand everything. And, and what's the best way? What's the way of doing things? So, yeah. I saw I saw Tasha s several times this across the room carrying something really heavy on your shoulder. <laughs> so it, it, that must be a comfortable way for you to carry your clay around. Yeah, I brought <laughs> about 20 pounds the other day, and everybody was looking at me as I was walking down the hall carrying it on my shoulder. Yeah. And then yesterday, well, I have a, a big put on my jacket and I threw another 20 pounds on the back <laughs> and I was walking around with her plastic poking out and everybody's looking at me. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about painting. Um, so I made, I made these plates yesterday and I usually for my, oh, there's just so much to say. I'm not, I'm not as organized today. I've, I'll back up and say, I'm on drugs <laughs> because um, I have really bad tremor. Uh, it's, it's inherited. I got it from my dad's part of the family. My sister has it. And so just this winter, I talked to my doctor and she told me to try Inderol, which is a beta blocker. And it's used, it's been around for a really long time. And it helps with uh, performance anxiety and it helps specifically with tremor. So over the years, I've, I've always drawn, it, it's like Tasha, we just drew when we were little I knew that we were gonna be needed to do art or in some fashion or another. So um, after I gave birth to my son, well actually while I was pregnant, I realized that I really preferred drawing to wedging clay <laughs> or cleaning up. So um, I started, af as soon as he was born, I just started drawing on my pots and I didn't realize what was gonna, how that was gonna be. But I started drawing pictures of babies even before he was born and then pretty soon it turned into this whole series called the Good Children series, which is basically about how to raise a child because I found parenting baffling. <laughs> and uh, I certainly was sleep deprived. And, and so I, I thought a lot about how my parents raised me and what aspects of Asian-ness were being carried through and, uh, and how I, I looked at a lot of the socialist realist pictures of communist China where the kids are you know, they're doing the harvest or they're carrying guns or whatever, they're sent, being sent off in rocket ships. And I realized that the, the image of the child is very much a symbol for, for the future and for potential and for getting it right and for teaching and learning and being wholesome and uh, how, they want, how they want to pass, how the Soviets or the communists wanted to pass on certain kind of uh, patterns of behavior to the younger generation. So I, as a Chinese American and being half sincere and half ironic, <laughs> most of my uh, work about the good children was making fun of the parental expectations of good children to be scientists and to be um, really good at everything and popular and and good at sports. So I always made these idealized children that were doing good things. So my kid is now 36 and I'm still drawing 
pictures of little kids and you know how you do questions sometimes, what are you doing? What, what's this all about? Why am I still drawing children? I think I realized that the image of the child is really still about potential and about play and about vulnerability and about the future and, it's, and about lineage. And it's, it's also about cute. And um, cute is something when I, when I started drawing these little kids, it was like a no, no, you're not supposed to do anything cute. You're supposed to be big and bold and abstract and, and you know, think these large thoughts, but I was doing these little tiny cutesy things. And I think part of me rebelled against that kind of canon and it seems right to me. Um, my mom even said, these are good. <laughs> Keep doing these. And it's funny how you have these layers of audience. But anyway, it, was, it made me really happy to have my mom like that aspect of my work. Um, so, moving on to all the series that I've worked on using these good children. They've, they've appeared in lots of different formats, but a recent development, or it's not that recent, maybe five years ago or so, still using the image of the child. I'm, I'm, I'm investigating so many different things about uh, my borderline state between two cultures. And one of the issues that I think is interesting is the issue of language. And language is super important I think, in culture, in that um, it's subtle. If you know a language, you learn a lot more about how that country, the people of that country think, um, and how, how they see the world, I think, just by how the language is structured and how it is used. So I think I like the idea of how difficult it is sometimes to translate between two languages. And so uh, one, this one series that I've made uh, sort of makes fun of translation. So I've done a series of plates and flashcards and um, other kinds of things that involve translation. And my joke is that if you want to learn either Chinese or English, you can use the words that have been taken from the other culture. So I'm going to be making uh, a plate about um, eating, so it's a plate, right? So when you're, when you're making your work, you think, why am I making this shape? Well, it's a plate, so what could it serve? Oh, that's about the size for a sandwich or a hamburger or a salad. Okay, I'll make a kid eating a hamburger, and what's the Chinese word for hamburger? It's han bao bao. So I, I began this whole series of words that deal with the translation, and and the way you learn. Okay, so when my mom wanted, she came to the United States and she wanted to learn how to say toothbrush, she invented the, I think the word is mnemonic, is that right? I think it starts with an M, but I think you don't pronounce it. So she invented the term tuzbulashi, which means the, the rabbit doesn't have diarrhea. <laughs> And that was a really good way for her to remember how to say this thing. <laughs> <laughs> or the other phrase is, how do you do? Which is, how do you do? Which means, the more grease, the better. <laughs> so I, I'm just, I just think, I think language is fun and funny. I'm gonna say one more thing when I get around to um, making that vase. Uh, I'm going to use the words, and not only is it going to be a little bit about the containment and ginger jar and advertising, but specifically because my work is so much about identity, that piece will eventually become wonita, which are the first wor words that you learn when you're learning Chinese. It's wo, I, ni, you, ta. And the thing about ta, which is just so culturally relevant right now, is that ta can mean he, she, or it. And we don't have a good word for that right now. <laughs> so um, I, I also think that that's interesting. And I don't, 
I, I tried to think, well, why, what, it, what does that say about the culture? And I, I think that the fact that, there, that Ta can be either gender, or not only either gender, but a book or a tool or something, the thing that I think is interesting about that is not so much that the genders were equal because they clearly weren't. The one child policy, if you had a girl, forget it. Um, however, I think because there were so many people in China, I think it's the devaluation of the mass so that the he or she is the same as the it. So it's sort of like there's you and me and then there's it. <laughs> and my mom always used to say, when she would introduce someone, she would say, this is new. She wouldn't say, he's new or she's new. It was, this is new. So it's like the other. Anyway, so that's my little spiel on language. And I'll, I'll just paint for a while, but um, a, a technical thing for painting is that I practically always, almost always use the tiniest brush. It's crazy. And also with my shaky hands, I have to paint with two hands a lot of the times. And, and Anyway, painting is tricky for me, but it still, still seems like I want to do it. And also, because I really care about line, the Chinese, of course, are very involved with line quality. So I do a lot of scraping away. So I do all my painting on greenware so I can remove, if my line is too thick or if my hand jerks, I can remove it easily. It's much, of course, much harder on bisqueware. Um, I'm using mostly underglazes, and I started using these Duncan Easy Strokes. And for some of you guys who do a lot of underglaze painting, you know that Duncan, dang them, went out of business. So I'm sorry, but I bought up all the coral red <laughs> in, <laughs> in the country. <laughs> And the coral red, when you look at the vase in the, in the piece at the Weston Museum, everybody goes, oh, I love that color. How do you get it? Because you know copper reds. You know how difficult reds are. Well, guess what? That's coral red. <laughs> Straight out of the bottle, only overfired. So that's how that gets that color and that surface. But it's so easy, I'm sort of embarrassed. <laughs> But can I tell one more story, Tasha? Oh, yes, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> so the only other story I have is, of course, so I taught for 30 years. And I, I was the only one. I was the main person in the ceramics department for a long time at University of Montana. So it fell to me to teach the glaze calculation class. So what I copied from Patty Warashina, as you go through all the triaxial blends and all the material testing, and then for the final, you just say, everybody studied really hard, and you just pass out a jar of Duncan and say, okay, if you can open it, you pass. <laughs> <laughs> My table. So, you. anyway. But, but, you know, language, I was thinking about how you're, you're, I don't know if, you're, if you feel comfortable with your language, Tasha, but your pronunciation is beautiful. Oh, thank you. It's really, it's wonderful to hear. I, and I'm not that good either with Chinese. I'm, I'm a, definitely a baby talk Chinese person. <laughs> oh, I know a lot of words. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, not fluent 100%, you know. Can you understand more than you can speak? Or yes. Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. So like, for instance, when we're at Longhouse and they're conducting a ceremony, I can kind of have, have the gist of what they're saying, what they're doing, what they're, what they're giving thanks for, what they're acknowledging. And um, if they're telling you to listen, because mm. that's part of it too, then yeah. Mm -hmm. The words are very descriptive. It's fun to know. Um, an example would be, let's see, what could I say, an example? Like, I like the word gajinu ducks. It's a monkey, 
but it really means a bug picker. <laughs> or um, skawi loane is a turkey, and it really means it's a crybaby. That, that sound that it makes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Very descriptive words. And we also have words like you were d talking about that are, you know, her, him, that mm. group of them over there, or all of them. Uh -huh. Aguego means all of us. Aguego aska didawat winuni. It's like, um, you know, aguego is all of us. Is there a written, was there an, a, a, an ancient written language or was it just spoken? It was spoken and then it was translated by or transcribed by a lot of like the Jesuits mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, like there's weird spelling. So like, for an example, like um, K is pronounced like a G, a T is pronounced like a D, a R is pronounced like a L. So like my daughter's name is Yuanwia Hawi, and it means that she carries the morning dew. And my son Sayant Gwalawane, his name means that it's a big smoke. Oyant Gwalawane is the tobacco, and so the, the, t the, the tobacco smoke is what carries our thoughts and our prayers to the Creator. We use it in all of our ceremony. Tobacco is a big, important item in my culture. And so that's why I also do the, the clay pipes, because that, in my mind, you, the pipe is like your direct line to the creator, to Sungwaya Dizo. So when you're, you're giving thanks or you're, anything you're thinking or you're saying, it goes to the creator with the smoke. Um, could I ask a question for both of you? There's been a lot of talk about a lot of passion in inserting your culture into the art world, even when um, you've um, felt um, points of tension or um, antagonism in the past. Is there a way that people who don't identify with that culture can view, as we only have our personal experiences and worldviews to view art with, is there a way or a method that we can think when looking at the cultural work in a way that you would that that would help us understand better? Or there are frustrations with how people have viewed work in the past that, um, th that can cause um, frustration? Well, I don't know if this is exactly what you're asking, but um, one of the struggles that I've had throughout my whole life is my, my last name. Mm. Smoke Santiago, I have two last names. And um, Smoke's my mom's last name, and Santiago is my dad's last name. My dad's family is from Puerto Rico, and he says that they're Taino, the indigenous people of Puerto Rico. But then I've been told that there's no such thing anymore, that they were all murdered, you know, through colonization. But I don't believe that. I've been there, and I've seen a lot of um, people who who look like me, and and they they, um, I want to know about that part of my culture. I don't know like my dad's side of the family, but being that I, I'm I was raised you know Mohawk and I'm, I'm Mohawk. I feel like I um, when I lived in Rochester before we moved to Akwizasne. I used to get picked on all the time for smoke because that wasn't a common name that you would hear. And so when we moved home to the reservation, I thought that I was finally gonna fit in. I was so happy. I'm gonna go be with my people and they're gonna love me and they're gonna accept me and I'm gonna fit in. And, then it, and I didn't because of Santiago. Hmm. They're like, nobody else has that name. And so, I got made fun of quite a bit in school, very awful. And it, it had to fight to be accepted into the community. And um, that was really hard for me. I felt alone for a long time. And my artwork was my escape, hmm. my place where I felt happy 
and um, all kinds of good feelings. But um, I would get it from my own people. I would get it at art shows. I get it all the time. Some people are really rude. They'll say, Santiago, that's not Indian. You know, as though I had a choice in who I am. And why do I have to prove to anyone how, how Indian I am, how much native? Who in the world has to ever prove their blood quantum besides us? And that we're federally recognized and I have identification to say that I'm a legit, a real native person on, in Canada and the US. I don't want that. I have that. And I'm, you know, grateful that I, in some ways, that some people don't have that and some people want that. But I also don't like parts of it. You know, for instance, uh, being from Akwesasne, we're a sovereign nation territory. And, um, we have, uh, like I said, the U.S., we have New York, Quebec, and Ontario. And so I have the two forms of identification. I have, I have from the St. Regis Mohawk tribe on the American side, and I have Indian and Northern Affairs Canada. But when I go through the border with my identification, I have to pick which one to use to get through easier. And when, you, when they ask you where you're coming from, and if I say Akwesasne, they want to know which portion. Hmm. They want to know, are you coming from the US or Canada, which is a direct violation <laughs> of our sovereignty. Huh. So there's things that people don't really realize. I mean, those kind of struggles. Um, I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but um, I, I do struggle. That's my struggle, is being questioned on both sides of who I am and, and, and in a way that sometimes people treat me like um, I'm less than or not enough or that I have to prove myself just because of my name. I and had no idea. I was going to ask you about your name. I was, I was going to ask you if there was any choice in your name. I didn't realize that there oh. was from the two parents. Yeah. Um, my mom and my dad weren't married, and my mom was going to name me Smoke, and then my dad begged her to add his name on. Oh. So he, she did, <laughs> and so I have an interesting conversation. You know, some people are genuinely, genuinely interested, I, don't get me wrong, you know. It is a cool last name, it is, but, it's a, and it's I, different, and I'm the only one who has those two last names in that combination together. It's but, uh, a beautiful name, and it's so appropriate for your work. Yeah, a lot of people get a kick out of the smoke with smoke, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, I hope that's not too heavy, the stuff I shared with you. It's just something that was my struggle growing up, and that I've had to overcome and find my own comfort and my own, you know, my own... However, I, I manage my feelings about that. I, I wasn't sure exactly what your question referred to. It's, for, for my understanding, you were more talking about how can you, as a non-Asian or non-Native person, understand our culture, one of a culture that's not foreign, that's foreign to you, is that correct? Or more how to view because we, we because I can't understand to a certain extent, and when I have that ignorance within me, how can I'm, I view how can I view your work with that ignorance still like present? If that makes sense, I I think you you view it from where you come from, and I think it's totally legitimate and wonderful uh, for you to take as much as you can gain from what we present and, and hopefully it's open and has a feeling of learning for you. And um, one of the things that I feel like uh, if I have any political impact at all, 
I think one of the things that I would like to think that my work does is uh, make people feel comfortable with that which is foreign. So that because, because of the humor maybe in some of my work and because of the multicultural aspect that I'm saying, you can't understand this Chinese text, but just look at it and you'll get something from it. And then I try to, I try to put maybe a translation on the back or in the title or something and just leave this as an introduction. But the first impact is like, I remember when I saw, for instance, um, my Cuban art historian friend who brought in a painter and there was like Spanish written all over it and I, I didn't, had no idea what it said, but it, the idea that I didn't know, I didn't understand, was very welcome to me. It was like, oh yeah, this is foreign. And it's not that it's like that oriental exoticism, it's just that it's different and it exists out there, outside of me. And you nod and say, yeah, that's good. And we're not afraid of it and we're not down on it. It's just there. Um, I think the other little aspect that I'm always interested in is uh, cultural appropriation. And I both, we talked about this a little bit yesterday that uh, I think both of us feel like it's better to present and let people borrow and learn than it is to be territorial about it. So if you, I, I mean, okay, there's a, little, there's a little bit of me that goes, don't put that chop on your work, that's not Chinese. <laughs> or you're not quite using it right, or just everybody's making a love tattoo on their arm or something. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of that that you kind of go, eh. But I'd rather have that than have it be shut down. Or, because if you take that to an extreme, it's like, you can't cook Chinese. That's, you, you, that's not okay, because that's my culture. So I think it, you have to err on the side of being more open and sharing and about teaching and learning than about ownership. So I don't know. Does that yeah, get at yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, yesterday I did mention how one of my elders, I've heard him say that it's important to share and to so that things will continue to go through life, such as like a recipe, right? If, if I hoard a recipe, it's so good, everybody loves it, but I just want to hoard it to myself, it, it dies with me, you know, rather than sharing, sharing is caring, you know, <laughs> share. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, you know, understand things like ceremonial, sacredness like at home that's not something that we would just put out there that's personal that's like private but everything else like sharing the pottery you know that's it's good to share i think here's a, a little thing about the way i draw um so my abstraction is always these huge, the heads are really big, the hands are really tiny. And some of it is the hands being really tiny to me captures that feeling of vulnerability and innocence a little bit. They're just, their they're, uh, agency in the world is small <laughs> because their hands are small. I think that's kind of what that's saying. But um, two things, when I paint, I usually paint the head first, and then I paint the hands next. And uh, I belong to a figure drawing group, so we do, we practice drawing all the time. And even though they're cartoony, I feel like there's certain things that I want to get right. And one of them is the gesture of the hands, because I feel like the gesture of the hands is very descriptive in terms of how the human meets the world and what they're doing. And if I can get a little bit of realism there, I feel like it carries over to all the abstraction that I do of the figure. Um, and one of another little 
trivia bit is that uh, one of my heroes and artists, uh, Fernando Patero of Colombia, do you know his work? The, the figures are, there's a lot of uh, figures that are fat and bureaucratic or um, they're just oversized, you know, they're just, everything is chubby. His fruit bowls are chubby. Everything has this kind of bloated look and I think it's a commentary for him on excess to a certain extent. But you also, I did read an interview with him where he said, uh, somebody asked him, why do you paint everybody so fat? And he goes, they're, they're not fat. And that's how they look to him. And I feel like this is how people or kids or myself look to me. Because after a while, it just feels very normal to me to have these outsized, uh, outsized heads and little tiny hands. So, so far you can see the hamburger. Yeah, you guys can all see. I mean, they said, don't pick it up and show it, just work and they'll, the cameras will catch it. So, okay, good. So I usually try to, um, so we'll, we'll put ketchup and mustard on the table just to make sure people know it's a hamburger. <laughs> This is, this is underglaze. This, this is uh, Amico, and this black is great. This is, uh, I think, the, the black and the jet black, I've never figured out if there's any difference. I just use whatever's handy. I almost always use a plate or some kind of palette because if you just go straight here, here, you can't control what's, how much is on your brush. When I, when I have friends come and work in the studio, they, they don't realize that when you're painting, you have to lay the material down. You can't, you can't use it in the same way as paint, somehow underglaze and glaze, because there's so much uh, particulate in the color. You have to use the brush in a different way. Um, so a palette is really important for me to get the right amount. I use, always have paper towel and a cloth or apron or something to try to get the right amount of water and material. Um, and then these are all, these are the easy strokes. I always keep them upside down so they're ready to squeeze out <laughs> and they don't get the water first. So, and, and usually when I start, so I'll, I usually do the, all the black first and then I'll squeeze out a palette of colors. And you don't have to use these. What you, what you need to do is figure out a palette that works you know, figure out what colors you like, and, and then you can develop it, and you can figure out how to use it. It's really helpful to me to not buy a new color every week. <laughs> and I, I, when I do, I find I end up sticking to a lot of the same colors over and over again. So I think Coyote makes good colors. I think Speedball makes good colors. So I, th I think Mako is a brand that was really old and has kind of come back and I think they're they're good too. So you're, you're just starting to put a little color in your work, huh? What do you think about color? Because you were a painter at first. Yes. Um, so I've dabbled with a little bit of acrylic at times, trying it out and then sealing the outside of the pot with a polyurethane or a sparurethane, like the the oil base of it so that um, it absorbs really nicely into the clay. And I like to use a satin. I don't like the super glossy. Um, but I am very interested in um, trying out some, a little bit of glazing, not too much, but I want to see more, um, try out more firing techniques. I mentioned yesterday that I tried copper sulfate out for the first time, and I really liked it. That was beautiful. My oh. friend that I mentioned to you yesterday that did a kind of a, a smoking firing in it, and I remember I, remember I told you, he's, it almost like he was doing a dance, because he was always baffling the fire or adding something and just dancing around the fire the whole time. He, he uses ferrous sulfate, mm -hmm. and he, got, he gets incredible color with that. It's toxic, too, though, you know, and yeah. that, that's an issue that we ceramicists always have, is toxicity. 
how do you how do you deal with that? Um, some. I do have a question. Hi, I'm over here on this side. Hi, uh, yesterday I actually came to your guys' lecture and it's been incredible listening to both of your guys' stories. And towards the beginning of the lecture yesterday, you had talked about happy accidents and I thought that was such like a beautiful way to put it. And um, I'm a beginner potter and I personally am struggling with uh, accepting my happy accidents. So. <laughs> I don't know if that's something that you guys struggled with at the beginning of your careers or if it's still something that you're working towards now. Uh, if there's any advice that you could give towards accepting the happy accidents that happen within each other's work. Sometimes I, I just feel like it's meant to be. Yeah. I don't, it might feel like upsetting at first, but then if you like just embrace it and look at it and think about it, and you might see something in it, and then something comes out of it. I call it, I call it just going with it. Just go with it. And sometimes that's the best work. Like, you might not have thought about it on your own when it just kind of came through, you know? I think that if you got involved in ceramics, you're doomed. <laughs> 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 uh, it just seems like there's always something that surprises you or comes out wrong in the kiln and and you can learn from it. Over firing was one of the best things that that happened to to me. I, you can take low fire glazes and fire them at high temperatures and they run and if you're doing o oxidation in electric kilns sometimes you can't get anything that's got any fire in it at all. You can't get anything that's got movement or depth. So this 06 glaze, at, I, I put an 11 in my cone sitter. And you can get these beautiful, I think it's called reticulation, where it breaks over the surface. And it's, it's hard to do that sometimes in oxidation. So, yeah. I think that's true. Also, um, University of Montana, we produced a, um, a t-shirt that we sold for a while that said, I hate ceramics. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's, we've all been there, you know? <laughs> oh, thank so, you so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I'll do this now. Okay, I'm gonna take a break from drawing. And, uh, just the, one the, other. Oh, sorry. Before oh, you put I, that up. Go ahead, I um, think go ahead. You were using the knife to etch out a piece yes. of it. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit and what that was for? Well, again, it's because of my shaky hands. So um, I'm really particular about my line quality, and I, I'm just not as good as I used to be. It's just uh, yesterday I spent a little time, in, and I, I do this. I'm sort of anal, so I wrote down things that I wanted to talk about. One of the things I wanted to talk about is that I'm not young anymore, so there are some good things about having done ceramics for a long time, and then there's some challenges, and one of them is facility, and uh, I, have, I have tremor in my family, and that's why I hand build more than I throw now, because I can't get anything up over about 11 inches in, in uh, porcelain. I can't. I just... I'm <laughs> so... Uh, with my line quality, I used to always, my lines were always so good and so clean, like Tasha's lines. So I'm jealous of your lines. <laughs> oh. But anyway, um, now I'm, I can't get a clean line usually with, that's longer than a couple inches without scratching some off. But it's also, I know that I can erase anything. And my, my professor, Rudy Audio, got a, um, uh, sandblaster, and he said after he got it, he hated it because he realized that he could erase glaze firing. So he never could figure out when he was done because he could always get rid of it and redo. But erasing is not something that comes easily with clay, but you can, you can find ways to get rid of stuff. So, so I'm going to finish. I'm going to make a lid for this and hopefully start painting on this pretty soon. So I'm, um, yeah, thanks. 
Hi, Natasha. My name is Karen Hymas, and I'm curious. I'm really curious about indigenous plants being used to treat trauma for healing. Um, are there any plants that you discovered that your ancestors used and any vessels that were made to house those plants in addition to tobacco? Thanks, Lee. Right. Um, I'm sorry, I sort of forgot about Well, we have a lot of different plants remedies for different things. Um, in terms of like um, <coughs> trauma, I think that we, ha well, we, I know that we have, it's called a condolence ceremony. And it's usually done after a loss when someone passes away. And it's, you're supposed to grieve your hardest when, when you lose someone, for instance, and you're supposed to like get it all out. You're supposed to, for the whole year, you're supposed to like let it all out. But in a condolence ceremony, they, what they do is they, um, they comb your hair. Hmm. They clear, they, like they clear your eyes, ears, nose, throat with the, with the eagle feather and your, take a drink of water to, to clear your throat, and that allows you to, to hear again, to see clearly again, and to, to have a voice again, to speak again. And, you know, and part of that, um, you know, you could burn tobacco if you were having a hard time, like maybe letting something go or you just needed to put it out, put it out there. Um, I will say, in my own experience, uh, I was going through a, a major depression a few years ago, so, so bad that I couldn't really get out of bed. Mm -hmm. And it was a chore to get up to feed my son. It was awful. And one of the things that really meant the world to me, that helped me to get better, was my sister came over and she combed my hair. And she did it more than one time. And, and I mean, my hair was a mess, all snarled. And it just made me think about um, our people and the, the, going back to our old ways, you know, to help one another. And that simple act, I felt so loved and cared for, and that I could just be me. You know, be it, it's okay to not have a good day sometimes, but that they're here for you. And so, um, I don't know of any other, you know, medicines, but there's a lot of medicines for other things. You know, like the strawberries, the women's medicine, it's a good blood cleanser. It's the leader of all the berries. It's the first one that, that comes up in the spring, early summer. I know sassafras is um, good, also blood thinner, but you can't drink too much of that. It's really good though. Um, hope I answered your question. So right now I'm just, um, I added a, a hand slab. And I talked about it yesterday that I did, when I learned it was uh, the coiling process um, but I find, like, to me, it seems like a waste of time for what I'm doing because I'm ending up shaping it this way anyway, so it's like a bunch of unnecessary pinching. So that's why I do the flat and the slab. It thins it out, makes it taller. I made a joke, I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I just found an easier way. Uh, when I, I just glance over every so often and... Uh, one thing that just impresses me is just how loving your touch is and how smooth everything looks and looks so touched. And I really like that. Thank you. And, and, and then I also, I wanted to ask you about the texture on some of those pots that are at the show. Are you good? Do you texture the outside of these or? Yes. Oh, and by the way, Tasha, that was really nice of you to share about your sister. Oh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, but so tell me about the texture. 
Oh, so the texture, I have some corn here. I have different types of corn. Oh, okay. And um, so I have different sizes. This is a Tanawanda Seneca Flint corn. It's a purple and white corn. And I love this one, very special to me. And um, this one is, um, uh, I believe it's from Nevada. My, I think a Washu Paiute, a friend of mine had given it to, to us, that's their traditional seed. And this is a glass gem popcorn. And uh, so I have the three different sizes. You could see this corn is more rounded. This one uh, has the more larger kernels and then I like the little teeny tiny. So depending on what, if I want little tiny texture mm. or I want the bigger. But yesterday when I did this piece, I used the Tanawanda corn. And that was the first time I used the Tanawanda corn uh, you can tell that I haven't used this one a lot because a lot of the kernels are still there. <laughs> <laughs> and every time these pop off, I'm like kind of sad. And uh, I save the seeds in hopes that I'll put them in the garden, but I don't know if that's going to happen. I have so many different like seed bags around. And did you know you can plant popcorn with regular corn and they won't cross? They don't have the same genetic code to unlock, so you can plant your popcorn alongside your regular corn and they won't cross, hmm. if any of you are avid gardeners. So I'm gonna let this one sit, and I'm gonna finish the design on this, the corn pot. Thank you. Beth, I have a question for you over here on your left. Oh, oh hi, Sean. Hi. Um, I'm just reflecting my experience with you in undergrad, and um, you know, one of the words that I keep coming back to is um, safe. Safe. Yeah, is that you created an extremely safe environment um, to allow students to be vulnerable, and um, and which helped bring an, uh, a depth to my work uh, and other uh, of my classmates. And I think what that happened from there is that it created a culture within this, the studio that people can find, go to a vulnerable place and know that they're not going to, you know, um, kind of uh, be treated with respect in that, in that space. Um, and can you talk about a little bit of your teaching approach of trying to allow or help students find a more vulnerable place? Well, I am really happy to know that that is how you felt. And Sean is an amazing artist, and he's teaching at South Carolina right now, so that makes me really happy. <laughs> um, but I, I think that um, Teaching is, is really interesting, and I, loved, I love teaching, and I'm really glad I'm retired now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they, uh, the students, I, I just feel like you have to try to meet them where they are, and so maybe that's that issue of being able to let people find their vulnerability. And um, I have a dancer friend who is a contemporary dancer, and he says that when he performs, he has to get vulnerable himself during the performance in order to connect with the audience. So maybe I, when I interact with them, I, I try to be able to be vulnerable too. Maybe, maybe that helps, I don't know. Um, but I, I think that would be important and something that I would try to do. I think one of the interesting things about teaching that I am, grateful that I, I, I don't have that responsibility anymore, <laughs> is to know that not everybody is supposed to be an artist, and not everybody is supposed to be a contemporary artist. So in, your, in the academic situation, you're supposed to be teaching, you're not teaching commercial art. I had so many students that probably would have been better at a commercial arts school. And so I tried to, so what I tried to do is say, this is what we, this is how, what you're gonna get here if you're at school, so take it or 
you should know that that's not the only way. And maybe that leaves room for people to feel like uh, they're not demanded to be a certain way, or that if they if they're you know if they're getting pressure to be a contemporary artist, that that is only one way of being an artist in the world. Because the thing that I realized is that there are people that can throw and there are people that can hand build and they're both good artists, but sometimes the hand builders can't throw and maybe the throwers can't draw a figure or maybe the person who draws a figure can't draw a tree. I can't draw buildings worth beans. <laughs> so it's, there's just, I, I think the encouragement as a teacher of, of letting people have to understand what their choices are and what their um, uh, abilities to find what's good for them, what makes sense to them. I talk, as a teacher, I talk a lot about comfort zone and out of comfort zone and how to weave between those places. And to grow, you have to go out of your comfort zone some, but you should know where your comfort zone is or, you know, expand your comfort zone but that there's, there's a spiral or a zigzag or something uh, path to find. So, yeah. is that good? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Um, so, I'm going to do the lid and kind of, you know, like I, I said yesterday, my techniques are like, they are like ceramics one. I'm... I, I feel like uh, my way of being an artist is not uh, so much about craftsmanship. Uh, I, I know some people who are just incredible craftsmen, and I think my strengths are um, experimentation and, to a certain extent, content in my work um, and a willingness to to uh, experiment and work hard <laughs> and keep going and try new things. Um, but I'm really, this is like ceramics one lid. <laughs> I don't feel like I've got any really good trick to make a lid fit and to look great. Um, the person I always compare myself to craftsmanship wise is Steve Lee from uh, formerly the head of the Archie Bray Foundation, but he, his, um, his form and his surface is so clean, and mine is always a little bit messy and good enough. It's like my motto is, well, it's good enough. <laughs> my, uh, there's another guy, Bobby Silverman. Do you guys know Bobby Silverman's work? He says he won't even listen to music when he's throwing because he needs to pay attention to the form that much. So I just, I'm not like that at all. Like I said yesterday, I usually listen to sports <laughs> when I'm working in my studio. Like I really love, I love a game going on. It's really weird. <laughs> I don't know a lot of people who like, who listen, who are sports fans and potters, but I really like, I like that. I like how much attention you have to pay, not too much. But there's a great narrative through the course of a couple hours. It can keep you going for a long time. And I got it from my mom. She's a sports fiend. Beth, do you like football? Yes. Who day? <laughs> what? Who day? Who day? <laughs> it's the, t the local football here. <laughs> Who day? Getting you in trouble. <laughs> Who day? What? That's what they say. The, the football team. Is that for Bengals? That's, yeah. <laughs> What's it refer to? Huh? Who day is the Bengal tiger? Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Who day Good. think they're gonna beat them Bengals? <laughs> okay. I like football, but I don't watch it while I'm working. Yeah, I don't watch. I I well, actually, I confess. <laughs> I just got YouTube TV, and I just, <laughs> I try not to, I try not to, but sometimes I'll just set the screen up and play a game while I'm working, but mostly I'm listening, I'm not, I'm not looking.
Do you like to watch movie or do you like movies playing in the background ever? Like your favorite? I've movie? never tried that. I like Goodfellas because <laughs> <laughs> it's all narrated and it's my, one of my favorite movies. So I just know what's going on just by. Oh, listening. so you watch it over and over. <laughs> See all these true confessions come out. <laughs> I I would I didn't allow myself to watch a movie. I think I said that might be too engaging. Just you know, listening. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's what I do mostly with the sports, too, is mostly listen. But then I got to see a really good play. Then you can, you can rewind it. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a question for Beth Lowe. Yes. Cool. Um, so something I'm particularly drawn to with your work is the way um, your illustrations specifically work with form. I think particularly about... Um, those cups with babies swimming and uh -huh. their heads are like the circle that comes out. Yeah. I was wondering how that, if you could talk a bit about how that process is for you. Like when you make the form, did you know that, for example, those cups, did you know that they were going to be baby swimming or did you decide that afterwards? I'm trying to remember because I've been making those for probably seven or eight years now. Um, I think... I think I knew, because um, I usually start, I start a lot of my work with sketchbook, and I do think a little bit about form and surface, and I don't want, uh, I would, the, it's a benefit if you can find some way to meld form and surface. So even, for instance, on this vase, I will put um, lugs on so that it, the surface, it makes you see front and back, if you didn't have the lugs, you'd have to have a continuous image. So for that, I think I remember thinking I wanted to do swimmers, and I was thinking about drowning. I did some sculptures about, about figures that, whose heads are just above water, or floating. And, and um, I think I could find a sketchbook image of me putting the drawing the swimmer on that cup. And... Um, I think I decided to square it off to make it look more like a pool or something, and then with that lifted head. Um, yeah, and that's, it, it, that's something that has worked. I think, it's, I think it's a strong combination of form and surface. Um, things like these plates, even though they're not real strong form, um, I think that they're trays or plates, so I do think about what image makes sense on there. Sometimes I don't, but sometimes when I first started making them, I, the first one I made was a butter dish, and I had found the oval press thing that I could make the plate with, and I went, this looks like just like the size of that cube of, of butter that you buy, so then I, I painted little kids with butter knives and toast, and um, then the larger pieces were about, okay, that's about the size of a snack or a sandwich or something, so I'll, I'll paint that food on there. So I really very much like it when I can pair it. But more recently, I've started to, I have a, so these, these forms, are, some are found and some are um, made, friends, or like Lee or my assistant will make. <laughs> make a form for me. And then I just cut out the clay and then push it down and the sides come up. Um, so I have a big one and I'm using that only as an illustration plate. But I think of a little bit of it like the, the kinds of commemorative trays that you have for Turkey where there's just, um, it's maybe a, a souvenir of a town or something, you know, like Philadelphia or something. And these larger ones I'm using to make uh, portraits of Chinese restaurants. Oh, cool. So that has a souvenir, a little bit of a souvenir quality. So yeah, I think about form and surface a lot. And it's just like a bonus. It's like if you can get a form that adds content to your drawing, all the better. Thank you so much. I yeah. So I'm going to put, finish this lid. What time have we got? Oh, I 
got to hurry a little bit. Where is my... Hi, Natasha and Beth. I have a question for both of you. I'm on the, the right here. Um, I've just enjoyed watching both of you yesterday and today, and um, thank you for being here. I wonder if you can both talk about um, people who've been significant in your life, significant influences in your art, and what are the things you've learned from them? Tasha, you okay. Uh, one person that in particular that comes to mind is Pete Jones, Peter B. Jones. He's Onondaga Potter. He's a sculptor. He does a lot of wheel work. And I noticed now he's starting, starting to get more into some hand building. He's in, the, he's in my slideshow, if you get a chance, we're the ones interlocking arms with holding our pipes. Um, but I remember being at eye height to his table at, growing up, seeing him at, at all the art shows. And um, I always loved his work. And when I started doing my pottery, we were at an art show and he came over and he was like inspecting all my pipes and stuff. And uh, I had asked him who, if he knew anyone who had a kiln for sale, I was in need of a kiln. And he said, well, I have one. He said, I'll give it to you wow. if you come get it. And what I later found out was that it was his backup kiln. He had two backup kilns. So I had borrowed my mom's truck and I went there the following weekend and I picked it up. And I was so grateful because I knew that he must have saw something in my work that he would do such a thing, give away his own backup, you know, of his livelihood. But he in turn allowed me to grow and, you know, he, he enabled me, I should say, he helped me to become independent and to not have to ask others to Just try it. Was a, it was really difficult for me not having a kiln. I had a friend who lived an hour and a half away who had ki a kiln that she was helping me, but it, w it seemed like I would need things to last minute. And it was, you know, hour and a half away, one way, that's three hours of driving. It was too much. So I think of Pete. And I, I didn't mention it today, but I mentioned it yesterday. He, w he and his son, Mike, were the first ones that taught me with clay before I learned at home in Akwizasne. So um, Pete, but also my, gran my grandparents, my mom. If it weren't for them, I totally, I wouldn't be where I am today with their support and their, their knowledge their teachings, their patience, their love. For me, oh, yeah. also family. Um, my mom, who's just an uh, amazing role model, just she was a person that I, um, I was able to take care of her uh, for a few years at the end of her life. She had, she, um, she was in assisted living, but I saw her pretty much every day, and a lot of times I'd bring her to my house, and she's a Chinese painter, and this is a postcard of her, of her work, and she was, she's self-taught, but um, I was able to share my love of art with her, and we'd work in the studio together and listen to Patsy Cline <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> She was, she was just a great personality and person who just knew how to accept everything in her life and her health challenges and stuff. She just was there all the time, ready to participate in any way that she could. Um, my sister, who uh, wrote children's books with me, so she, we have written a couple, or she's written, she's did, written the text and um, I did the illustrations. The illustrations in this book are all done on porcelain and fired and then uh, photographed. So uh, this is shameless advertising. 
Cleus. And then one more shameless ad, uh, my husband David, who is so kind, and he, he's, uh, first of all, he's the person that plays guitar to my bass. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, Shonda. I had to make fun of you again. So she said I was a bass player, and I'm, I'm a bass player. <laughs> Anyway, um, David is uh, an incredible musician, and we get to play music together. We, we have probably one, at least once a week, we have a gig of some kind or another. We play in a bunch of different bands, and um, he's, he's taught me a lot of what I know about music, and uh, also, he's, he's the person that I go, David, would you come in here and look at this? Do you like this better or this better? And he's wonderful. And he's, he's a person that, I mean, I dragged him here to Ansika so I would have somebody that I was totally comfortable with to be with all the time. So um, he's really incredible, and I'm really happy that he came. And... Shameless advertising. He just wrote a book. It's about his mother. So we're both very family oriented. Uh, first of all, David was incredible with my mother um, because she was in our lives quite a bit and he was wonderful about helping with her. And um, this book is about his mother, who interestingly enough lived in Shanghai, probably the same time as my mother lived in Shanghai. But she was part of uh, the Jewish diaspora that came, her grandmother came from Odessa, which I almost pronounced Odessa, <laughs> because the first audiobook version of this book came out and we found out later that it was read by somebody named Walter Brown who was an AI. And he pronounced Odessa, Odessa? I mean, he pronounced Odessa, Odessa. And he pronounced David's grandmother's name wrong and he pronounced Kobe Japan, Kobe. So we, when we heard that we went, this is not right, this has got to be fake and we realized it was artificial intelligence. So he, he went back and re-recorded it. But this is a really, really good book. He's a really good writer and he worked on it for many years. So advertising. So this is, thank you to David for coming with me. So that's somebody that's important to me. And there, you know, people are important in so many different ways. There's also the artists that have come before that when, when an artist like Frida Kahlo does work about her own suffering, her ethnicity, her love for Diego, and so vulnerable, like that gives you permission to do that yourself, to, work, to do work that is autobiographical. So all those artists, the, the flow of art history actually does make sense because people who open doors for you give you an idea about what you can do yourself. Uh, Beth Lowe, that's a perfect segue for uh, my question. I, uh, as an undergraduate decades ago, always admired um, Betty, or Patty Barrett Warashina's work. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, first of all, if she was uh, an influence uh, for you in, in, in moving from your earlier sort of, I think you described it as sort of ab abstract expressionist kind mm -hmm. of work yeah. to clay. And then um, also I began to enjoy your work and um, I've noticed that there seemed to be a proliferation of younger uh, people with the same sort of imagery. Um, I met uh, a fine fellow named Kenneth Snipe Snipes oh, yeah. uh, years ago and in Cleveland, I believe, and doing that sort of imagery in a, in a very contemporary way. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of observations, but um, I, I guess I especially wondered about uh, Patty Warashina's possible influence on you, or you might have had some sort of relationship uh, and so forth. Well, I've, I've, Patty, I love Patty. I love her work, I love her personality, and she's a Northwest artist, and she's an incredible female role model. Um, and she also started out making pots that looked 
like she just loved effects of reduction pottery. That's what, you know, her covered jars with surface where the, the glaze just does amazing things. I think that uh, the, that I think probably led her to the idea of imagery on surface. Um, but then she just went wild. I mean, it just seemed like there were no holds barred for her. She, she has very strong vision, I feel like. She's a person who has, like someone like Fernanda Batera, the world looks a certain way to her. And I just have nothing but great admiration. She is the neatest person, too. She is just... I got to, spend, to do a residency with her and Esther Shimazu. So it was these three Asian women. And we just had such a great time. And I just admire her spirit so much. Um, Kevin Snipes' work, when I saw Kevin Snipes' work, I went, oh my God, it just it was such a feeling of relation. And I think, I think some of it comes from a generation that grew up with cartooning. I think that cartoons became part of our literature and we just somehow or another took it seriously. And it's not that we became, there's tons and tons of graphic novels. It's not quite like that. It's more like the classic cartoons like Crazy Cat or um, even even some Disney. Or My, my favorite is Little Lulu, <laughs> if you want to know. But I think that uh, there's certain kind of abstraction that, that we, we really appreciated. And I think that... Um, I think this sort of uh, imagery of the child has become really popular too. I've seen a lot of people working with images of babies or children and I, I think that's, uh, well, to be completely honest, I think that I, I opened the door for a few people to do children. So that's, that's another benefit of longevity. <laughs> so I think we can dry that a little bit too. I think we could put it on and dry it a little bit. Anyway, I hope that answers that question. Natasha, um, I noticed that you were working with a bone, it looked like, or? Yeah, I have a fish vertebrae. Fish. And that, that's what I use to make the circles, the seed right here. Mm -hmm. And then the other question is, um, do, you, do you go shoeless when you make your work? I notice, you're not, I notice you're not wearing shoes, and I think that's cool. And I, I, is that something that you just feel more comfortable doing? Um, I don't like wearing shoes. <laughs> I wear, I'm barefoot all the time at home. Flip-flops sometimes. Like if, I'll wear flip-flops till it's snowing out. I don't know why. I just always like to be grounded. I have very wide feet because I'm always barefoot. And I just feel more comfortable. And I meant to bring my moccasins, but I forgot them. I would have liked to have brought my grandma's moccasins that she makes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, a follow-up to their question, or their yeah, question about the fishbone. I'm noticing that you're using a lot of objects to create some of the surface textures on this um, vessel. And I'm wondering how you view these objects. Like, do you see them just as like aids to create the surface decoration? Or are you seeing them as like being fully incorporated into the actual piece, if that makes sense? Um, I feel like they're really special. And I feel like um, really connected to my ancestors when I use the tools that they would have used. And I know that not everyone has these tools. Yeah. And so, like especially this one, I, I, I shared this one yesterday. This is a deer, it's like a tendon bone. And the Oneida elder had gif gifted it to me with the knowledge that I didn't know that it was a prized potter tool a long time ago. And that it's not found in all deer. It's only in some deers, which is, makes it more rare. Yeah. And so I really love this piece. And I'm going to use it around 
down here on the bottom. I also have, I have some fish ribs. I have different bones. I have this one. I, I like this one's nice and pointy. Mm -hmm. But we're known to use the fish jaw, jaw bones, sometimes the scales, and for sure the, the vertebrae to make the circles. So that's what I did right here, mm -hmm. to make the circles. And I made a joke yesterday. I like this size. It's a big pen. <laughs> <laughs> don't have a fish ver vertebrae that small, but they're the same concept. Yeah. I also have some bone tools. We had done a lot of stamp work historically. If you look at the archaeology, there's a lot of stamp work and effigies. They started off more like flat, and then they evolved into the more dimensional faces and animals probably the animal clans. I also have the, the deer antler. I used that yesterday to do the little, the little circles here. But also you could use it at the top at an angle, much like your, you know, the wooden tool, mm -hmm. you know, that you can get that little wave pattern. Yeah. So you can use, you know, different tools. And then um, I have an example here. I don't have a I don't have a paddle with it wrapped around it, but our oldest pottery was simply a paddle design. There was no other etchings in the oldest pottery, and so we would use um, the bark twine that would be wrapped around a paddle or a stick, and that was just simply paddled all the way around. And that would have that kind of texture, and then it evolved into like more like the paddle and the shell. A lot of shell markings. Um, and then, of course, the corn. You'll find that in the archaeology as well. Beautiful. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Beth. Um, uh, you're applying your colors on right now. I'm assuming this is at a greenware stage. I mm -hmm. missed that. And what kind of brushes are you using for those really, really fine lines? And last question, um, what's the order for your kind of color palette? I noticed you went dark first. Do you leave your lights towards the very, very end? Or do you do multiple stacked firings for the colors to set? Um, I. Like I was saying, somehow or another, I end up using, I, they're all bamboo brushes. Um, actually, I have a couple that aren't, but I don't know if I brought them. This one, I think, this one's not. This one um, was given to me by um, Chris Antiman. She says she uses this all the time. But I usually end up using these teeny tiny bamboo brushes. And um, I have relatives in China. And they asked me, what did I want? And I said, brushes. And they sent me probably 100 brushes. And it's really interesting, because when we first went to China, they had very little. When, when I first went in 1995, and we brought them things like Bic pens and um, stickers and clothes and duct tape and you know just ridiculous stuff. But they. They had so little at that time, but they're, you know, as you know, China's economy has gone fast to change a lot. So they're, they're, they're always sending us stuff now. And when we go to visit, they have, they're always proud that their cell phones are better than our cell phones. <laughs> but anyway, so I used, also because my hands shake, I used to use uh, longer and bigger brushes and I could control the tip, but now I have to work slower and use tiny brushes. Um, I use copper a lot. Uh, I try to put almost uh, most of the colors down on greenware, so as I said, so I can scrape off any rays. Um, but I don't have a particular order. I just go, okay, I feel like doing the red right now. And I specifically thought with the time limit, I would get the lips in because that completes the face. So you can see the red and then the ketchup bottle. And then I'll do the calligraphy in red. And then, um, but I always use copper to give some movement and depth to that sort of uh, uh, electric kiln 
look, which can sometimes look very cold and flat, and the copper will warm it up. A lot of you, the person who asked about the swimmer cups, I always do a shadowing, uh, or I often do a shadowing of copper around my drawings, which separates it a little bit from the surface that it's drawn on, and uh, that I will do last. But in this case, because I'm not gonna shadow the figure, I put the copper, I, I like to create depth by uh, putting this background wash of either plain copper or copper in another color. I'm sure there's images going by that show these, these plates with the language lessons that shows the, the I almost have sort of a, a sky or a background, and again, it gives depth to the piece with a copper wash, and it's just copper carbonate and water. Um, otherwise, I just put all my colors out on a palette, and I'm just like a coloring book. I, I thought about the popularity of coloring that kind of happened lately, uh, where there's all these coloring books out there, and coloring is very fun. <laughs> and you can sit around with friends and color, and when I was little, I loved coloring, and I was just terrible about coloring in the lines. I was totally fine with coloring in the lines. <laughs> Beth, did you prefer crayons or markers? Crayons. I like the markers. <laughs> <laughs> markers are so precise, mm -hmm. you know. And markers, markers didn't come, they didn't, they didn't have such good markers. I'm like way older than you. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't have such good markers. So cray crayons were it. And, you know, you got the box with 64 and... Mm -hmm. One thing I think is interesting is um, that they like to make up names for colors. In ceramics, too, they make up names for colors. It's, if you buy, you know, if you have a glaze, it's got a name. And it's usually sort of, oh, I did the wrong mouth. Wasn't thinking. Okay, I'll get rid of it. It's a little wet. I'll scrape it off, though. I think I can do it. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Yeah, is that, did that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Actually, one last question. Do you ever use any other uh, washes with any other elements? Or is copper really? Copper's good? it for me, pretty much. I've tried, and um, my student, Krista Ames, talked about manganese. She's done some stuff with pure manganese, which is really toxic, but um, she gets some pretty good metallic with that, and. It, so I might, I might mess with that a little bit, but mostly it's copper. Thank you. At least in oxidation. So you can see this is somebody, this person is eating this hamburger. Yesterday I, got, I was thirsty after you said orange juice. <laughs> and now you're like hamburger and I'm like, mm, hamburger. <laughs> Hello, I'm over here. Hi. Hi. This question is for Beth. Um, my name is Iris. I'm a half Asian, half white person, and your, your work just really resonates with me, and I wanted to say I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Um, I was especially seeing up on the screens some of your work of a, a small figure in a bucket kind of mm -hmm. peering out. That really spoke to me. And I was wondering if you feel comfortable, if you could talk more about what that work meant to you. That, that piece is um, very personal. And, um, you know, a lot of times people have pieces that really are important to them, and that, that's one of them. And um, I, I think uh, yesterday I, I talked about um, uh, reverence and seriousness versus irony and um, irreverence and uh, a lot of my work is humorous and satirical and ironic and irreverent and that that piece to me is like quite dead serious and um, it's a uh, it's it's about some of the depths of frustration and um, hopelessness, I think, and 
and Lee and I have talked about our lucky, jolly lives, but we still can get, uh, you can talk yourself into big holes a lot of times. And so that, that piece is about barely surviving. And the, 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 a lot of times I use Celadon to represent water. So the swimmer cups are, have gotten pretty happy, but the, that piece is, is, about, is, is more about the dangerous aspect of water. Um, I used to be a, addicted to I Ching person where I'd have to throw the I Ching every day to find out what I was supposed to do that day. <laughs> the I Ching is a divination tool that's ancient and you throw coins or in the old days you jumbled around with yarrow sticks. Um, I can't remember what year it's from, it's very, very old, but after you throw the coins, it's a belief that everything happens at now is linked. So if you throw the coins, you'll figure out what verse in this book to read that will tell you the important message that you're supposed to know today from this instant. And I would throw the I Ching and I would consistently get the one that is water slash the abysmal. And this was like, whoa, I got water again. <laughs> and it would really freak me out because it, it seemed like a, a dangerous, it seemed like I was in a dangerous place a lot. So that, that came from that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I could really feel that sense of kind of trappedness and isolation when I looked at it and it really resonated with me. So thank you. Yeah, and that piece is called Flood. And uh, it's, I, I wanted to give it the sense that the, there was a flood and you had to put buckets around the house where it was leaking through the roof. And um, I'd also reference the, the, the term flood of tears. Don't, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. And I still own that piece. <laughs> if anybody knows and wants to buy it. <laughs> Beth, I was going to ask you, do you ever get really attached to pieces and you don't want to let them go right away? Like you have to hang on to them for a while before you let them go? A few, yes. A lot of them I want to go out the door. But yeah, there's a few. And the one I was telling, was it to you? I was telling somebody about the one that was the first one where I drew a Chinese face on a vase. And it doesn't really look like a Chinese face, but I could see that's what I was doing. And it's not the best piece in the world, but I felt like I needed to keep that piece because it was a, a, change, a game changer for me. Mm -hmm. And how about you? Oh, are, yes. Are any of the pieces in the show favorites? <laughs> well, of course, um the large one I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. That's the largest one that I've, I've done so far. And it has a lot of meaning, it has a lot of symbolism. It has a very traditional shape, but it's very contemporary with the, the paint and the micro detail in the face. Um, and then also that I had put the necklace and the earrings through, that's different. Um, and then also that kind of goes through all the ages of of women, it has the baby, the adolescent, the young lady, and the grandma. And it has the, the strawberries that represent our lineage, our bloodline, I talked about that earlier, but the vine, even though I don't have a lot of vine on, on the actual pot, the vine represents like future generations and our, our bloodline lineage kind of passing on. So that one's very special to me. But if you look at the show, there's the bear. It says not for sale. That one, that one's really special to me. That one smoked so beautiful. I, I, it's like pulling a gift out of the fire. You don't know what it's going to look like. And, um, but if you go look at it, it, it smoked uh, quite a bit darker on the, the, not, the nose. And it has like a white chin on the bear. And there's even like a little nostril that shows through. And so I feel like... I could never accomplish that again, even if I wanted to. It just happened on its own. It was such a gift. I find the smoke is such a gift. And it's so fun, because you, you just really don't know. You can try to influence all you want with where you put the cedar or how hard you press the cedar against. I even tried using 
um, recently I tried um, using twine, uh, metal, to tie that cedar very tightly onto the pot, and it didn't it didn't make a difference <laughs> without co like comparatively to not using the twine and just setting it against the pot. I, I, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but um, the bear is pretty special to me because I, my grandfather was bear clan. And I had gifted that little pot to my youngest son. He loves that pot and uh, I wanted to keep it in the family like a little heirloom piece. Mm -hmm. And he's my little sidekick, my son, Lungwet Diel. He has been into the clay since he was a baby. I would put him in his height chair, put clay and tools, and he would get engrossed in the creat creative process. And then, of course, I mentioned this yesterday, I have to help make tractors and things, cars, once in a <laughs> while. <laughs> but now he, um, he'll ask, he'll say, Mom, can I do clay with you? And he'll make his own items. The most recent items, I'm, I love it. It's just so cute. And he put a lot of detail. He put in a lot of time into these little tiny little men. They had a canoe. They had a pipe. They had a bow and arrow. There was fish. So I like to see that. And I hope that, my hope is that he'll carry it on. You know, maybe one of my children will be doing the traditional pottery someday and maybe teaching as well, or at least I hope. What is his last name? Um, he has his dad's last name, <laughs> Sergeant. But uh, Lungwe Dio means that he's a beautiful person, his whole being, his inside and his outside. And his sister named him wow. Lungwe Dio. Um, I have a question for Beth. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, so I noticed that you have a lot of like swimming figures, and I love swimming figures and use them in my work, and I was just curious what they meant to you, um, aside from the ones you already talked about, maybe the happier swimming figures. Mm -hmm. um, when I moved to Montana from the Midwest, I'm going to just say the swimming is way better in the West. <laughs> Um, I discovered swimming in natural lakes and rivers and um, farther west, the ocean, but that um, I never felt that free and uh, enjoyed that feeling of immersion. There's, I've read a couple of books about people who, who swim and they all say, you know, you, you immerse yourself and you come out, you feel like a new person. Um, so I, I thought, well, that must be why they invented baptism, <laughs> you know, because it really works. It really gives you this, this brand new person feeling, and you, you're so alone, but you're so at one with nature. So I don't know if that's what your relation is with swimming, but no. <laughs> but then, you know, the whole thing of water as being both life-giving and also life-threatening. So I think it's a wonderful, powerful symbol. Um, what about you then? Um, I do swimmers because I grew up like in the suburbs and a swim team is like a big thing in suburbia and just like something to do during the summer mm -hmm. um, and like a very strange culture, so very different. Uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> yeah. I like your swimmers a lot though, they're beautiful. Yeah, well, yeah, when it has some kind of personal meaning for you, that's, it's a great place to go, and you can extrapolate from that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, Beth, I'm over here. Curious if you could just talk about what you're doing right now. It looked like a minute ago you had, were incising some of the text, so I'm curious about your choice making in that process of like what yeah. text or illustration you're incising and what's just being painted. Um, I, the reason that I incised before I put the red down is because um, there's copper 
there's copper underneath the blue, so I wanted to make sure that the red will stand out. So I, I incised and then I painted the, the red in there. And, um, but I almost always, so at some point, I'm gonna do this all through the, or in a few places through the piece because, again, because oxidation firing has so little depth in it that if you can create a feeling of depth or like maybe I'll do something like this, those cartoon marks to give movement or something like that or maybe a line of speech or speech bubble or something, some kind of, I, I try to have a few different kinds of marks to create um, layers or feeling of layers, even if there aren't any. <laughs> and so I'm, what I'm doing right now is there's this thing called pinyin, which is the, the uh, transliteration of, of Chinese using um, English, or what, what's the word? Uh, what's the word for A, B, C, D? The alphabet, anyway. And, and they've come up, in my lifetime alone, they've had three different romanizations for Chinese. And um, the current one involves a lot of X's and Q's that you may have noticed. <laughs> but like my mother's name is pronounced Joshuan, and the romanization in the 40s was Jia sound is, starts with a K, K-I-A. And Xuan, the sh sound was H-S. So my dad's name was Xu, and his name is H-S-U, and my mom's name is K-I-A-H-S-U-A-N-G. It's pronounced Jashuan. But it's different. If now it would probably be J-I-A, maybe X, X, I'm not even sure, X-U-A-N, maybe. So in high school, I learned a third romanization. Anyway, so this is Han Bao, and it's Han Bao Bao, and my Chinese isn't that good, but that's, that's, uh, that's, that's that romanization. So I'm gonna spend a little time working on the vase, just because I said I would, and I can see time is short. Otherwise, I would end up pretty much coloring this in with semi-realistic, naturalistic colors. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> Oh, yes, I do. So this is a question more so for Natasha, but you work really precisely and methodically, and I can see it is, from an outside perspective, pretty meditatively, um, and it, it's soft, like you're very soft with your pots and you touch them so delicately. And then you smoke them, which is like this harsh, unpredictable firing method where I could see it is equally meditative because you're like working with the fire and nurturing the fire. But I don't know, I was wondering if you saw those as like this harsh firing process versus this soft, delicate building process and maybe expand on that if you had thoughts on them or not. Well, the fire, it can be rough. It can be really overpowering at times. Um, but I know that it's the, the fire is special and um, I'm just gonna I consider the fire sacred and so I have like respect for it and I know that um, I don't have control over it I don't try to control it I mean I you know I'll try my best to I've learned that over time that you can't control it and you shouldn't try to because it's its own you know it's its own and so um, you can try to um, make it go how you want it the best you can try to guide it um, but you have to like listen and you have to watch and 
And of course you have all these feelings, especially when you get emotionally attached to a pot. It's so scary. And you have to sometimes you like surrender and be okay with it. Like it might not make it, the, the peace might not make it. And you just put all that time into it and you'll have to accept that. So I feel like it's taught me a lot and especially more recently learning to be patient, learning to surrender, going with the process, just, just roll with it, go with it, see what happens. Um, when, I, when I smoked that one pot, uh, our friend Sharif Bey, he, um, he's been kind of taking me under his wing and helping me out quite a bit. I really, uh, that means the world to me. And when I was smoking that large pot, we were discussing it prior, like all the, you know, bouncing ideas around how to, what's the best way, what, you know, I had a hundred questions to ask him. And then eventually he just looked at me and he said, he said, just do it, go do it. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I was like, but they told me you were the smoke master. <laughs> He's like, oh, I don't know about that. He's like, just go do it. So I did. I went out there by myself and I did it. And I did it very slowly. Like I described earlier, I made a box and slowed down the, the oxygen, slowed down the fire, and I babied it. And I did mention this yesterday, but Sharif came outside and he was kind of confused. It was like hours later. He's like, what's, what's going on? Like, what's taking it so, <laughs> what's taking so long? And then I explained to him why and what I was doing. He goes, oh, he was like, that makes sense. He's like, well, you know, he was very encouraging about it. And, and it was, I was so happy at the end of the day. It was like I was exhausted and I brought this big, huge pot in. Some of the SU students were there and they're, they're um, the one, one person was like, are you okay? <laughs> I'm like, yes. Like, you know, it's like I just made this, I, this big accomplishment and there's this big sense of like relief and satisfaction or like I feel proud and but very grateful because I know that I didn't, I didn't really have control over any of that. I just had to try my best. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> I always have to tell a big long story when I do start telling stories. I don't know if these guys have heard some of your food stories. Do you want to tell those again? Or do you have another story? I'm realizing we're running low on time. Well, one of my favorite stories that I had shared yesterday was when I was, on a, and I was invited to a, an indigenous food summit. They, they had commissioned me to make um, two large pots that we were going to cook in. And it, it was the first time that I had ever was going to attempt to cook in my pottery. I had always wondered, but I never made the time to experiment with it. And I was afraid that the, that the pot was gonna break in front of all these people. And so I really had to research what type of clay that I wanted to use. And I ended up going with the micaceous clay from New Mexico because that's what they use. A lot of the uh, Southwest potters, friends of mine, they said that it makes their beans taste better. It makes them sweeter. And I think that, I think that it, when it rolls against the pot, it helps break down the hull of the bean to make it more digestible. So I, that's the type of clay that I chose. And I also went with a raku clay because the, my thought was that if uh, there's a rapid heat fluctuation, that it's gonna be able to handle that shock and not just break. And, and it, it did, they survived. The first thing that we, we had cooked was the chaga tea. And then also um, we made soup. I was paired with someone from Oaxaca, Mexico, and they showed me how, what their traditional tech, technique of sealing the inside of the pot so that it can hold the, the, 
moisture, the, the soup. So basically, um, they used lime, the mineral lime, and they made a, like a consistency like similar to pancake mix. They poured it in the pot, and they simmered it for about an hour before they dumped it out, rinsed it out, and then we cooked the soup. So I thought that was really neat to, to learn, to know that like, that's their traditional method of sealing the pottery so that it can hold liquid. Um, but traditionally, the Haudenosaunee, we use bear fat, we use bear lard. So we put it on the inside, and of course it absorbs through, but it comes to the outside of the pot. And that's one thing that I, I discovered with cooking with the pottery, was, and I didn't share this yesterday, was that the pot absorbs, it, it, it's like um, almost like an evaporation, and it, it's like breathing, and so it's like sucking in the liquid and putting it back in, it's like kind of like going in and out. And the way that, I, that we discovered this was when I was working with, uh, I was paired with Chef Arlie Dockstader, who is from Oneida, Wisconsin, so we're both Haudenosaunee, which is why I think they paired us together. Uh, we had cooked in two separate pots. His pots were the Haudenosaunee style, but they were glazed. And then my pot was the natural pot. His corn mush, he mixed all the same ingredients into both pots at the same time. They were completely different. The, the pot that was glazed, the corn mush was very watery, and the corn was the dominant flavor. Whereas the natural pot, it was so fluffy. I had never had experienced fluffy corn mush in all the corn mush that I've had throughout my life. Very fluffy, <laughs> and I mentioned how he was, uh, as a chef, he was like, oh my God you can taste the smoke and you can taste the earth. And he was just like blown away with it. But while we were cooking, he was, became stumped because all of a sudden, like after he mixed everything, we were seeing big, huge pockets of maple syrup showing up in my pot. And he's like, what's going on here? It's, I already mixed all this. This is, it was boggling his mind as a chef. And then the gentleman who was there helping said, oh, he's like, the clay, it, it breathes, like it like sucks it in up to the surface and it puts it back in. So it's almost like this evaporation type. So, so that's why we would see all this maple syrup reappearing and then it would disappear and then we would see it again. So that was so fun. That was so, we were learning together. And then furthermore, uh, we ended up making maple sugar that same day in my other pot. And Kevin, who was the, the maple guy, said that we made history that day, that, that he had heard that many intellectual debates and arguments saying that Native people could or couldn't, did or didn't make maple sugar ever and that we kind of debunked that because we did it that day without any technology. We did it with a clay pot, a fire, a wooden ladle, and lots of singing, lots of stirring. <laughs> we took our time, and being that Kevin is like the maple expert, he said, okay, he's like, you guys can't mess this up. He's like, you, you only have four degrees. If you go over four degrees, it'll never, it'll never turn to maple sugar. So he said, when you see the bubbles, he's like, make sure you don't, they don't get bigger than the size of a deer eye. We're like, okay. So then the bubbles are starting to get bigger and we're like looking, like, is that the size of a deer eye? <laughs> you know, so we're like getting nervous while we're stirring it. So then we like pulled it off the fire when they started getting to the size of like a deer eye. And then we kept stirring and stirring. And then all of a sudden it turned into maple sugar and the aroma was beautiful. The presence of it was beautiful. It was a little bit eerie, because like when we stopped stirring it, it kind of kept moving. But it was beautiful. And it, it felt like we were, there was a connection there that I hadn't felt. Like I feel connected to a lot of things, but that was a new experience. I never felt that before. But it felt like familiar. You know, you hear people talk about ancestral memory and I just felt like, I felt that, and I still feel that when I work with my pots, 
when I, when I use the original tools, when I cook in them now, and I feel like I'm being guided or shown. Sometimes I dream about my work or, you know, just this strong pull to want to, to, to want to do all the things that my ancestors did in these pots. So I can't wait for later on this, this spring, summer, when fall, really, when we're going to start doing the project where we're burying the pots under the ground and, and storing them the way that my ancestors used to. So and that's a long story, but um, <laughs> that was fun. And um, I always look forward to working with Arlie. We're, I adopted him as my uncle, and he still comes out to the East Coast once in a while. He was at the Onondaga Nation School this past November, and we had a group of us together cooking again. And um, it's always nice to, to see it grow. There's starting to be, I guess you would call it a resurgence. Like There's so many people like interested and they want to participate and they want to help and they want to help cut up the food and they, I grew this squash or, you know, there's a certain pride to, to even like caretaking of these seeds. They're, it's an honor. It's a real honor and they're so special. And one thing that I wanted to share with you, like that's a part of our beliefs is like when, when like our mindset of like with the garden, the seed keeping is I was told that by an elder that the ends, it's for the animals. You know, how the deer nibble in the garden or, or insects get into it, that's for them. And then the best part right here in the middle usually has the best seeds, that's for your garden, for you have better seed next year. And then the people right here, that's for the people. So we all share, we're supposed to share that, you know, and I think that is really important that that mindset to not be greedy and to, we're all equal, we're all a part of this world and we're supposed to share. And so I hope that that is a little something that you hadn't heard and that maybe you'll think about when, when you're in your garden or, you know, you you're have little critters come along and take their portion and they're supposed to. So I think I'm done with this one. This is the, the corn pot. And that's the, the way that they, you would see these pieces in the archeology. span Sometimes they might be a little bit more rounded, but I, I made them a little bit more flattened. And I like to think of the, the circles as the seeds, but like there's, you know, the growing mound, the rose in the garden, the seeds. I might make these triangles into the, the old effigy faces. Sometimes you would see the old effigies inside of the, the triangles. Could we trade, trade? It's usually real simple, like um, just a circle, simple circle. Everyone, I just wanted to acknowledge we have about 15 minutes left, so if you have burning questions that are hanging somewhere in your head, no, get up here and ask them, okay? Hi, Beth, I'm Melissa. You had mentioned the other day that you're using white stoneware instead of yep. porcelain on this. And you usually cover it with a white slip before yeah. you paint? Yeah, and I didn't do that this time because... Of time, sure. Time, so... Um, and it, it's, it's, it's this clay called Mount Baker. It's from the Archie Bray Foundation. It's been around for quite a few years. And um, it's... It's, I, some people call it a porcelain, but it's got grog or something. It's, I think it may be malachite or something, so that it, it's just got some tooth. 
And so normally, yes, I would, I would cover this all with my growling slip, and I just, you know, I just take my clay body scraps and um, slake it down and make a slip. I don't add zirka packs or anything to it. It's just the exact clay body that I'm using for the smaller pieces, and uh, it's so far so good. Yeah, that's just <laughs> to give it a wider canvas to paint on, right? Yes, and it 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 still ha it still gets that little porcelain, it's kind of glassy glow, which is pretty impressive. It's pretty amazing that it can do that. Thank you. Yeah. So that's that's brand new. That's like a couple months that I've been doing that. It's pretty. It's I'm I'm liking it <laughs> so, so far. So you you can still learn new tricks. Beth, did you bring any uh, business cards or anything for folks to take when you when they're leaving? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, mine are down there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if anybody wants them after the show, after our presentation concludes. I have, I have a solo show coming up at Lucy Lacoste Gallery in Concord, Massachusetts, right outside of, of um, Boston. Uh, it opens May 13th, I think. And... Uh, I've, I've been working really hard for that show. I've pretty much been working all year for that show. So I'm hoping that if anybody's interested, they can look at that show. And then I have, um, that's going to be probably more uh, larger scale pieces. And there'll be some uh, more pottery. I'm going to be in the um, Montana Potter's Tour in July, and then I have, again, Small Works in, um, in Tandem Gallery with Hisu Lee in November. So I'm just trying to keep it going. And then a, a show with Steve Lee um, in Radius Gallery the, f uh, the following spring, and that'll be, that'll be really fun. So if you haven't uh, heard about the new ceramics hub, in Missoula, there's a great bunch of people running a, a new all ceramic space in Missoula. I know Lisa and Jason are here in Ensika. Hope you guys get a chance to meet them. How so, many pieces do you have in, in the Concord show? A lot, I think, because I have, I'll have um, quite a few vase forms and then some figures and some takeout box forms and uh and then my whole uh chinese restaurant plate series is going to be in that show so i have a burning question for yes Beth. um on one of your pieces there was um shino c-h-i and an n-o-t chai not chai not is that what I, I was trying to figure out what that meant? That's that's my. Um, so, have you ever heard of Chinette? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's Got China, it. which I love because Chinette is like fake China, and Chinette is fake paper plate. <laughs> <laughs> so, I I I did a Chinette. I brought my mold, so I just I just carved the fa in that font. I carved China, and um, the Boston. I did a collaboration with um, Adam Manley out of uh, San Diego, and um, we did a piece called To Go, and it's all about temporary temporary eating. So it's all China China dinnerware set on a, it, a fake paper box, a car, fake cardboard box made out of wood that has shipping labels all over it, but then you, you, when you open the leaves of the box, it turns into a table, and, you, and the china set is inside, and you can set it up on, your, on the leaves of the paper box. 
So like I said, I do the face and then I do the hands. The hands always, I, doesn't, I don't care too much about the arms. It's just if I get the hand gesture right, it's good. So um, this is probably going to be, well, the two, the two themes, so that it's about identity. So tea and rice are two things that I use as sort of symbols of my Chinese identity and the ginger jar shape. And then um, I will also, I won't have time, but the words wonita, I, you, he, she, it will be someplace on this piece. That's the theory. I have a question. So I guess I haven't been doing ceramics for very long, only like one or two years, but um, with each year or as time passes, um, at least for you guys, you guys take a lot of influence from your culture and your cultural background into how or well, into the work you produce and the shapes you produce. I guess over time, do you ever feel that urge to want to try something new and see if that works or if you still bring in influence from your past background, like your cultural background, I guess? You want to go, Tasha? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, well... It's important to me to always try to um, to share my, like uh, as much as I can through my artwork, mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm not only bringing it back, but also keeping it going for the future. And I find it so important and special. Um, I don't know if I'm really uh, answering your question. I feel like I probably also worded it poorly, so, <laughs> but thank you. Um, I think, it, it, yeah, for me, I, I think it, it may, maybe makes more sense for my work because um, I've, I've experimented with so many different kinds of things and I didn't sort of find this line of work until, and you know, till late in, I'd, I'd been doing ceramics for a long time, so I really love, I loved reduction pottery, and I mean, yeah, I think, I think I found something that works for me, and is very, uh, it, it, releases something for me. But then, yeah, sometimes you just, you don't want to put little Chinese faces on everything. And um, there's this weird thing called the market. And um, there's demand for work. And, and you kind of know what works and you know what you can get away with. And you're working with a gallery and they want your work to look look a certain way, so there's there's pressure to kind of make similar work. But you know that if you're going to stay alive, you have to you have to be inventive, and it, it comes and goes. And sometimes I go, okay, I'm making for this gallery, and sometimes I go, I've got to I got to shake it up a little bit, and um, I have sort of different levels of audience. I have I have pottery audience, I have collector audience, and I have um, maybe a little bit of a political audience, and, and I have my sister or my husband, David, who, I'm, who will be looking at that work, and so I do think, and then there's, of course, the me, yeah. But, um, yeah, sometimes I think I should do something like totally different, and maybe I will. <laughs> Um, I have a question for uh, Natasha. Um, so I'm a student in Colorado, and um, we're doing a local clay dig in Boulder um, coming up in a few months, I think, um, mm -hmm. with our class. And I was wondering if there's any sort of like, well, like where you source your clay, or if there's any sort of like tradition you guys use to like source local clay. Um, well, I don't know. There's a lot of clay up 
where I live, tons of clay. Um, I did speak about it yesterday that it's a highly polluted area up on the St. Lawrence River. Um, it's a uh, top 10 in the whole world in pollution, the super fun site. And so we have Alcoa, Reynolds, GM, Domtar, which are all factories that pollute the river. So that's why I don't like to use our clay. I get, I, I'm afraid to use it. That there's PCBs, fluoride, and other contaminants. So it's there, the clay is there, and it's very easy to find. It's like usually on the river banks. It's, um, it kind of shows itself, like it kind of falls down locally where, where, where it's at. There's even little teeny tiny shells in it. It's very beautiful clay. Um, but I'd like to get my clay, a commercial clay in Syracuse, New York from a, a clay company called Clayscapes. And I've been working with them for probably 15 or more years. And I really like to use the um, sculptor clay. That's my favorite, it's heavily grogged. There's all different kinds of clay, um, but I just go with the commercial, so I don't really know how to like say how to find clay out in the wild, you know? Yeah, I just didn't know if it was like a like a traditional thing, but I guess it's kind of changed over time, just because. Yeah, I think I think essentially because the pottery has been retired for so long that that practice. I'm sure there was, you know, and I'm sure we put down tobacco because we do that for all, whenever we pick medicines or anything, always leave an offering of tobacco. So like, that's probably what we did, but I don't know what that would have looked like. Okay. That part is gone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I have a question for both of you. Um, it's my first time at Nsika, and I've been wanting to come for almost a decade. Um, I stepped out of ceramics uh, for a couple years ago and now I'm in this relaunching phase of my work, in my work, and reapproaching the material in a new way. Um, and coming to Nsika and seeing all the artists and the inspiration, um, one thing that I really love is the, when artists are really strong with their voice in their work, and you can see a pot and you know that, you know it's like a Bethlo pot. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about um, authenticity and staying true to your voice in your work while also appreciating and being inspired by other people in their work. Um, how do you stay true to your own, you know, carving your own path for your work and, and your voice in your work? <laughs> I think that question was for you. Uh, okay. Um, I, th I think, um, it's, I think, you know, for me, longevity, again, is the, is the big thing that I've, I've been lucky to have, that I've just been doing it for so long that it's, it's pretty clear what I want to be doing. And I think that um, my, I'm so lucky to be retired, so I just get up and I go to my studio and you know, there's just, there's just all this forward momentum, so it's pretty easy to just kind of pick up. Um, I think that when you're younger, you're experimenting more, and when you're older, the, the two quotes that I use, um, one is Steve Lee, I only have so many ideas in my life, and John Buck, who said, you know, I've gotten so that my inspiration mostly comes from looking at my older work so that I, I kind of know where I'm going with it. Um, so there's those kinds of things. Um, I think you look for that spot in yourself where you really are satisfied with your own work. Are you the one that asked the question or are you a different question? Where the person who asked the question? They're over there. I don't know where that person is. Uh, but anyway, um, I just have to tell a story on one of my graduate students who overheard her fellow graduate student as they were both working late one night, and um, I'm going to make up the name to not incriminate the, uh, <laughs> the innocent. Uh, my friend said, I, I overheard John say, 
to himself. He was working late all by himself. He goes, oh, John, you're brilliant. <laughs> and, but it's that feeling when you know you're onto something and you go, yes, you're brilliant. And that's, I think that's staying true to yourself when you feel that feeling. And I think I can feel it when I get to a place in my pot where I go, yeah, that's right. And you, sometimes it's a matter of knowing when to stop and you get that feeling. That's, that's it, that's right. So maybe that's, maybe that's where you find your, you know where you find your voice. I know we have to quit soon. Did you have, should we keep going? Last question? Yeah, just one. Um, I had a question. Um, you were saying yesterday that your sister passed down the, her like Dene uh, tools to you from your stepdad, like shared some of them with you. And you also talked about how there's so few like Haudenosaunee uh, potters left. Um, and I was wondering how, um, because you've talked about how much sharing and community means to you, uh, how it affects you as an artist and your artwork being one of so few potters. Well, I feel this sense of um, urgency or um, responsibility is a better word. And I just, um, just keep working on it and doing as much as I can and learning as much as I can, sharing as much as I can. And um, yes, I did talk about the tools here, these metal tools. They were my stepfather's. He was a uh, Diné, he, Navajo from Northern Arizona. And um, he was a silversmith. And I used to watch him work too. I learned a lot from him and his family. And not just like jewelry, but like um, how to set up your table, how to present everything. And um, I, it was a shame to see them, all his tools just sitting on the desk. After he passed away, they were just sitting for a long time, right where he left them. And so, I wanted to try to use them. I think I might have even borrowed them right before he passed, because like, was, he wasn't using them because he was sick. I think that's what happened. And then um, I think he let me borrow them, and then, and then he passed, and then I asked my sister, because I felt they're hers, that's her dad. And it, you know, it goes to someone in your family, and, and that was his only daughter. So um, my sister let me keep using them and then eventually the rest went back to her and I asked to keep using these particular ones were my favorite. And the, mostly just because like the round ones are like larger than the fish vertebrae mm. and they have some nice little markings around on it. And then these three right here are different domes, which somebody asked me yesterday about my tattoo and um, I explained that these, these are the sky domes and that they represent the spirit world and that the, the tree right there, that's the man and the woman's breath coming together and creating life. So it, it, it's, a, it's like the, the tree of life and the heavens, the spirit world. So any type of dome work that you see on my pottery, that's like, that's the spirit world. And then I have the little V I like to think of like the same, the plant, the tree growing. And then I have a little teeny tiny circle, like little beads. And so those are the ones that were from, from him that I like to use. Um, what was the other part of your question? Um, I was just asking how you felt like it uh, affected you as an artist, but also like how it affected your artwork as you've progressed through your career. Well, again, responsibility. Yeah. Um, I just felt like I heard 
what my elder said. I felt it. It stuck with me. And then, and then I, it, I got pulled into it, and I kept doing it, and then loving it more and more and more. And then I get more and more inspired, and then more and more come out of it. And it brought me even here. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> and much. So that's, that's how it goes. Thank you. Well, I hope that all of you have gotten as much out of this as I have. And we so much appreciate Natasha and Beth being here and thank you all for coming and asking questions and making this even richer by asking different questions. So join me. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. <laughs>